Hello there, and welcome to Pick 6 Movies, a podcast where every season we pick six movies all related to a single theme, discuss how and why the movie was made, and then to cap it all off, we give you a full review of the entire film, start to finish, to see if it's any good. I'm Chad Cooper, and along with my co-host, Mr. Bo Ranstall, this season's theme is, We're All Gonna Die! Where we're taking on six movies all about the extermination of the human race. I'm currently under quarantine, trying not to die. What? You are too? Well, how's your quarantine going? Oh, mine's pretty fantastic, thank you for asking. I'm at home, watching the world as we know it slowly come to an end as the fabric of society is teased apart one thread at a time. But I'm 100% prepared for the end of times with multiple buckets of doomsday food purchased from disgraced televangelist Jim Baker, who fell from grace after having an affair with his secretary turned part-time Sam Kinison girlfriend, Jessica Hahn. These con man chilled plastic buckets of food are full of hearty dishes, including creamy stroganoff, black bean burgers, and fettuccine Alfredo. Yum, 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 yum. And let me tell you, this barely edible food stuff provides me with 100% of the daily diarrhea that I need to justify calling the closet I'm hiding in a panic room. This is episode two of season 11, and we have a terrifying vision of the future in the classic movie, The Happening, from once acclaimed director M. Night Shyamalan, and it stars Mark Wahlberg and Zoe De Chanel and the deadliest of all living creatures, Flora and Fauna. So while Bo introduces the movie, I'll ask that you excuse me while I finish off this plastic bag of pork chowder, then I'm gonna go pop a squat on one of my now empty food buckets and work to recycle this barely edible mouth garbage into fertilizer for when the day comes that I can return to the sunshine and grow my own food to begin life anew. Bo, get in here and school these people on Mr. M. Night Shyamalama Ding Dong. Oh, geez, I think I'm out of toilet paper. (laughs) This is going to be a mess. Distant, aloof, and painfully self-aggrandizing. So idiotic in conception and inept in execution that, after seeing it, one almost wonders whether it was real or imagined. An awful letdown. You just feel you've been conned by a cheap trick. These are just a handful of the reviews garnered by The Happening, the subject of tonight's discussion. At the 29th annual Razzies, The Happening was nominated for Worst Picture, Worst Actor for Mark Wahlberg, Worst Director, and Worst Screenplay for M. Night Shyamalan. Having come out the same year as the dreadful The Love Guru and a slew of Uwe Boll films, kept The Happening from racking up the wins, but in this case, it's a shaming just to be nominated. For many, this became the point where all the hype surrounding the Wonderkin director dissipated and the reality of Shyamalan's body of work came crashing down to earth. But to really appreciate how far he had fallen, you have to look at how high he climbed. So let's do this intro thing. While M. Night Shyamalan was born in India, a place called Mahe in the territory of Pondicherry, which I only mention because India has the best names for everything, despite being born there, his parents took him to Pin Valley, Pennsylvania, when he was only six weeks old. His real name is Manaj Neliyatui Shyamalan, which is also a pretty great name. Pin Valley was a wealthy area in the Philadelphia suburbs. His folks were both doctors and raised their son Hindu, even though they enrolled him in Waldron Mercy Academy, a Catholic school they decided on for its reputation as a strict academy that taught discipline. From there, he went to a couple of private Episcopal schools. His father had dreams of M. Knight becoming an Ivy League graduate, but it was not to be. His folks got him his first camera, a Super 8, when he was just 8 years old. From an early age, M. Night Shyamalan loved movies, and especially the work of Steven Spielberg. He would model much of his work on that of the blockbuster director. After high school, M. Night attended the Tisch School of the Arts at New York University. It was while he was studying at NYU that Manaj Neliatu became M. Night, and he launched himself into the world of film by raising money for, directing, and starring in his first film, 
entitled Praying with Anger. The movie was based on his own pilgrimage back to his birth country of India and focused on the differences between Indian and Western cultures and addressed issues of an aloof father and a doting mother. That was in 1992. It would be another six years before he helmed his next feature, a movie called Wide Awake, released in 1998. That movie cost about $6 million to make and had real stars in it. Dennis Leary and Robert Loggia and Dana Delaney. It was all about a kid searching for God after his grandfather, Robert Loggia, dies. It didn't make much money, but it did net Shyamalan a Young Artist Award nomination for Best Drama, which is something. While he wasn't setting the world on fire with movies he directed, he was doing pretty well at the writing game. He co-wrote Stuart Little, that animated mouse movie with Michael J. Fox as the voice, and was a ghostwriter on She's All That. But that's been disputed some by the credited writer. He also met with his longtime idol, Steven Spielberg, to write the fourth Indiana Jones movie, but that never panned out. Instead, Shyamalan turned his attention to writing a movie entitled The Sixth Sense. When the script was done, David Vogel, who was president of production for Walt Disney at the time, bought the script on site without ever consulting his bosses. For his part, Shyamalan got $3 million for the script and the right to direct the movie. That's some good negotiating. Disney canned Vogel, and no one else thought much of the script, which was then sold to Spyglass Entertainment. I probably don't have to tell you that The Sixth Sense was a hit, but it was a massive hit. It cost about $40 million to make, Bruce Willis didn't come cheap in those days, and it made almost $300 million in the U.S. alone. Worldwide, it made close to $700 million. Up yours, Disney! Except that they retained about 12% of the profits in the sale to Spyglass, so they did just fine by dumping the script. It became one of the biggest horror movies of all time, made a smash on home video, and thrust not just its boy star, Haley Joel Osment, into the spotlight, but writer and director M. Night Shyamalan into public consciousness too. Following the phenomenal success of The Sixth Sense, Shyamalan was hailed as the next Hitchcock, the next Spielberg, the next great voice in film. And one thing you can be sure of, you build someone up like that, there's gonna be a fall. In 2000, Shyamalan wrote and directed Unbreakable, reteaming him with actor who no longer gives a shit, Bruce Willis. Disney, no fools themselves, gave Shyamalan a first look deal for three films, meaning they wanted a peek, before anyone else, at what the new Master of the Macabre was up to. Turns out, it was a comic book origin movie that Disney was insistent on not playing as a comic book movie. This is the pre-Iron Man days when comic book movies were looked at as too niche for popular consumption, and so both the film and the marketing did its level best to hide the fact that this was a superhero origin story. Nonetheless, the movie would make about $250 million worldwide and was received pretty well by fans and critics. Next up was Signs in 2002 with Hollywood asshole Mel Gibson and a pre-Joker Joaquin Phoenix. While it went on to be a financial success, some of the bloom was fading on Shyamalan's rose. Variety critic Todd McCarthy displayed some near Nostradamus-level prognostication by saying, quote, After the overwrought Unbreakable, and now the meager signs, it's fair to speculate whether Shyamalan's persistence in replicating the otherworldly formula of the sixth sense might not be a futile and self-defeating exercise. Things got rockier with the release of 2004's The Village. Personal note, this is the movie where I was officially off the Shyamalan bandwagon. Known as a purveyor of twists, the twist in the village is so frustratingly dumb, it dares you to actually call it a movie. Pick 6 review mascot and top 10 dead guy Roger Ebert had great things to say about signs. But when it came to the village, Ebert said, quote, The village is a colossal miscalculation. A movie based on a premise that cannot support it, A premise so transparent it would be laughable were the movie not so deadly solemn. To call the ending an anticlimax would be an insult not only to climaxes, but to prefixes. It's a crummy secret about one step up the ladder of narrative originality from It Was All a Dream. It's so witless, in fact, that when we do discover the secret, we want to rewind the film so we don't know the secret anymore. I couldn't agree more. And after the rickety response to The Village, a generous description if ever there was one, Shyamalan was ready to unleash his own vision of artistry and storytelling onto the world. A story he told his kids at bedtime, The Lady in the Water was a work of pure imagination and terribleness. 
Shyamalan got pissed about Disney studio chief Dick Cook's seeming inability to grasp the point of his story, so he took the film to Warner Brothers. Once again, Disney plays it just right. The movie was a disaster, both critically and financially. Often, the next film of a popular director pays for the sins of the movie before, and the lackluster response to the village led to outright hemorrhaging of Lady in the Water, a financial loss by every measurement. Critic Michael Medved called it, quote, a full-out flamboyant cinematic disaster, a work of nearly unparalleled arrogance and vapidity, end quote. The movie got tagged for featuring M. Night Shyamalan so prominently, who cameoed a lot in his movies, but is featured significantly in this one, and as the movie surprise hero, a nearly godlike figure in the movie's narrative. But wait, Shyamalan said, I have a scary movie again. You guys are gonna love it. It's called The Happening. Well, originally it was called The Green Effect, but it was retitled The Happening on account of spookiness. 20th Century Fox got the honors of pain this time around, and they did make some money on the movie. While I'll leave debating the merits of this one for the conversation with Chad, let's just say it was not received well. Shyamalan told reporters the aim of the movie was to create a good B-movie, something that perhaps didn't take itself too seriously, but had a little more under the hood than your standard creature feature. The results left critics thoroughly underwhelmed. Mark Wahlberg was brought in on the lead, eager to shed his action star image for an opportunity to play a science teacher. Zoe Deschanel was tapped to be his co-star, hot off the success of Elf and The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and just before she would get her best-known role on New Girl. Their chemistry, or lack thereof, was of particular note in the savaging the movie took from critics. John Leguizamo, who plays a colleague of Mark Wahlberg's in the film, was all over the place in the 2000s. From his voice work in the Ice Age movies as, I assume, some sort of cartoon animal, to his work with some great directors like George Romero in Land of the Dead and Spike Lee in Summer of Sam. Mark Wahlberg perhaps summed up the response to The Happening best. A few years after the release of The Happening, Wahlberg was on a press tour in support of The Fighter, a film which co-starred Amy Adams. Amy Adams was up for the Zoe de Chanel role, and she and Wahlberg had met prior to The Fighter at a lunch in discussion of The Happening. Wahlberg said, quote, She dodged the bullet, and then I was still able to, I don't want to tell you what movie. All right, The Happening, fuck it. It is what it is. Fucking trees, man. The plants, fuck it. You can't blame me for wanting to try to play a science teacher. At least I wasn't a cop or a crook. End quote. The Happening hit theaters, got drummed by critics, made a few bucks, but Shyamalan stock had further fallen. Abandoning his own scripts for a bit, Shyamalan tried his hand at some big-budget and kid-friendly studio films. He directed The Last Airbender, a live-action adaptation of a very popular animated series, as well as adapting the screenplay. Before the film was released, it took heat for casting non-Asian actors in roles that were traditionally Asian in the series, or at least perceived as Asian. While the movie did make some money on the back of the name recognition and anticipation of a live-action version of the popular cartoon, this was another critical dunking on Shyamalan, who had become Hollywood's punching bag. Still dead guy Roger Ebert said, quote, The Last Airbender is an agonizing experience in every category I can think of and others still waiting to be invented. The laws of chance suggest that something should have gone right. Not here. Woof. After losing out on his Razzie nominations for The Happening, it was time for Shyamalan to rack up. The Last Airbender won Razzies for Worst Picture, Worst Supporting Actor, Worst Director, Worst Screenplay, and Worst Eye-Gouging Misuse of 3D. How have we not done this movie yet? Okay, so that didn't work out. How about a surefire hit in the form of a Will Smith action science fiction blockbuster? Smith had come up with a story based on some TV show he and his brother-in-law were watching. I swear this is all true. So Will Smith decides he wants to do a similar story to this survival story he saw on the TV about a father and son lost in the wilderness. He contacts a writer named Gary Whitta, who had done The Book of Eli a few years before with Denzel Washington, and Witta fleshed out the sci-fi story based on Smith's suggestion. Will Smith reached out to Shyamalan to direct, and the dream team came together to create After Earth. The resulting film and strangely series of tie-in novels was a, say it with me, financial and critical disappointment. Variety critic Scott Foundas suggested Shyamalan was disinterested in the film from first frame to last. 
Shyamalan himself said later, quote, I'm not really the best person to work in the system. That's right. When in doubt, blame the system. Then, in 2014, something miraculous happened. Shyamalan, in an effort to get his groove back, had written and directed a modest thriller in secret. Low budget with no named actors, the movie was called The Visit, and it features, hand to God, an old man smearing a used diaper in a kid's face, and it is glorious. At least that scene is. And the movie went on to make $100 million or so on a budget of about $5 million. The movie released in 2015, in a strange turn of events, was really well received. Shyamalan had his mojo working again, critics said. This was followed up by Split in 2017, and this time the success was far greater. Costing only about 10 million bucks, the movie grossed about $280 million worldwide, and critics loved it. And it's not a bad little thriller, and James McAvoy has a great time playing a man with multiple personalities, holding hostages, including the super-talented Anya Taylor-Joy. What people didn't know going in was that Split was actually a surprise sequel to Unbreakable, and the movie set the stage for the inevitable third part of this trilogy. Glass was released in 2019 and brought Bruce Willis back into his role from Unbreakable, James McAvoy reprised his villainous turn in Split, and even Samuel L. Jackson came back as the titular Glass. And while this may be disappointing for the crescendo to our tale of a movie-making odyssey, the results of Glass are pretty mundane. It did alright, the reviews were bad to okay, and Shyamalan seems content with his place in things. He says he's resigned to the notion that when people come to one of his movies, they expect a thriller, not a comic book movie, not a cartoon adaptation, and not a kid's bedtime story. Just a solid thriller with a possible twist at the end. He's done some TV here and there and produced some movies, but nothing that set the world on fire. Some you may know, like the Fox series Wayward Pines. Some you may not, like the Fox series Wayward Pines. But the guy is a working director. His movies bought him a big home in Pennsylvania where he lives and works, his wife and kids nearby. It sounds like a pretty good life. So, what's our Shyamalan-esque twist in this intro? Just this. Of his major releases, beginning with The Sixth Sense... He's directed 11 films, and you can argue about half are mediocre to good. That's batting 500 in sports terms. And that's about right for the man Shyamalan admired, a director by the name of Steven Spielberg. That guy's done almost 60 movies at the time of this recording, and of those, about half are really good. Now, you can say that the highs of Spielberg's career are far higher than Shyamalan's, and you may be right. But at the end of the day, what every artist does is step up to the plate and take their swings. Sometimes they hit, sometimes they don't. What changes is the critical and yes, fan perceptions. Is Shyamalan a bad director? Of course not. He's made some very good movies, and The Sixth Sense is a true work of art. Is he the second coming of Hitchcock? No. Nor is he the second coming of Spielberg, or Scorsese, or James Gunn, or Ari Aster. They're all individuals, all artists who attempt to tell a story the best way they know how. Sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. The real villain of most of these films is expectation. The audience's belief that somehow an artist must make a good movie every single time that they step up to the proverbial plate. Sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. Hey, speaking of it not working, let's drill down on one of the worst in the Shyamalan canon, the movie described by Marky Mark himself as a bad movie. And that guy ought to know, he's been in a bunch of them. So, without further ado... Ladies and gentlemen, toxins and breezes, it's 2008's The Happening. Hey there everyone, welcome back. To pick six movies. This is episode two of season eleven. We're all gonna die, and never <laughs> has that been more true. <laughs> I, of course, am Bo Ransell. With me, as always, the effervescent Chad Cooper. You know, Bo, we're all gonna die, but I met soon. So did I. What is That's, that from? It's from The Simpsons when they went to Camp Krusty. Oh, right. I have been slowly but surely working my way through the first 15 years of The Simpsons one episode at a time. Yeah, that's what I said I'm going to do when I get cancer. Not if, but when. Uh Uh-huh. 
All right. Well, yeah. I talked to a gypsy fortune teller. I was hunting <laughs> werewolves. I'm just kidding. I was out fucking a gypsy when I was a kid. Not now. I'm happily married. Sure. Strangely, your child has a fixation with beaded jewelry. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> <laughs> Most gypsy curses really should be tackier. <laughs> Boo! Yeah. Which M. Night Shyamalan movies are any good? Okay, so you got your sixth sense. Yes. You can make plenty of arguments for Signs and Unbreakable. I think Unbreakable is good. I enjoyed Signs, and I saw that in the theater, and if you can believe this, I was really drunk, and I was with my wife, and when we saw it, it was opening night, and there were these two teenagers behind us who wouldn't shut up, and I really got angry, and I stood up in a crowded theater, and I turned around and pointed to these two kids, because I was a, a grown man, and I told them, you two, shut the fuck up or i'm gonna beat the fuck out of both of you and it terrified them and the whole audience was just like yes thank you nice someone needed to say something i did not did i see signs in the theater maybe i was not a big fan of unbreakable conceptually it was interesting well conceptually lots of things are interesting but the execution <laughs> i mean <laughs> you know conceptually a trump presidency would be interesting to see but the reality of it is garbage much <laughs> like unbreakable i like to act one of the village the village makes me furious i can't even think about that movie Act one with the romantic relationship between our two principals, I found to be very charming. But then once we turn the page to act two and Bryce Dallas Magoo starts brailing her way all the way to the end of this movie and you get that big reveal and I, you're interested in it, but it's like, this is just stupid. Yeah. Again, you can make the arguments for those three. Then I think you have to jump to The Visit, which is not great, but it's it's pretty good. And like I said, it features an old man rubbing a used diaper in a little kid's face. Mm -hmm. Is that a documentary? <laughs> no, but it if you do that in your movie, you are the basement of that movie is a five out of ten. You know, you can only go up from there. I didn't see After Earth. I didn't see Last Airbender. I didn't see Split. Split's pretty good. Split, uh, genuinely a good movie. You know, the, the audience was the one that got twisted in that movie. Don't that was the know. twist. It's a sequel and you didn't know it, but you probably did. I, like, I don't give a shit about Unbreakable. So when the twist happened in that, I was like, Ugh. it kind of made the movie worse for being tied to Unbreakable. I didn't see Glass either. You got Unbroken, you got Split, you got Glass. It kind of sounds like a windshield replacement contractor. You know, he's trying to get some of that sweet, sweet self-life repair, self-life replace money. Here at Jerry's Auto, <laughs> auto Glass, <laughs> we can split Glass and Unbreakable. Speaking Twist! of M. Night Shyamalan movies, though, Chad, we're uh -huh. not doing none of those movies. No. We're doing... What is arguably not his worst film, <laughs> which is amazing to consider when you think of how shitty the movie The Happening is, which is the film we're going to be talking about tonight. Yeah. A movie, spoilers, if you've never seen The Happening, the premise of the film, of course, is that plants are trying to kill people, kind of. Right, and they're using the wind to kill them. A gentle breeze, to yes. be more accurate. Right, uh, like M. Night Shyamalan has a unique talent to tap into the fears of the common man. Uh -huh. And there is nothing more terrifying than, say, trees and gentle breezes. <laughs> what one might call picaresque, even, becomes terrifying, by which I mean ridiculous. <laughs> and I don't think there's any reason to beat around the, the bush, the killer bush. And we should just jump in and talk about the happening. Sure, because let's do it. Uh, look, we got a lot of ground to cover. The opening of this movie is a bit of foreshadowing, Chad. Because it? Yeah, because it opens on this blue sky, and mm -hmm. you hear the sounds of a breeze, and as Ooh. the credits are rolling, the sky gets increasingly dark, and uh -huh. the sound becomes more ominous. Oh my god. Because M. Night Shyamalan, Chad, oh is god. the master of the macabre. He is. And, and one thing worth noting in the credits here. Nobody cares about them. That's what you should know. <laughs> Cut this shit out and give me two minutes of my life back, movie. Uh, Tak Fujimoto is the director of photography on this thing. Who is a, you say so. 
is, I is a those. brilliant cinematographer. Okay. Well, I'll see that in the movie when I watch it. I don't know to know that up front. Uh, you know, I'm one of those nerds that's like, ooh, Tech Fujimoto. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's you. How about this? You watch the movie and you're like, that had good cinematography. Then you'll see it at the end. Quit wasting my time, movie. Right. But he was like the DP for like Silence of the Lambs and like worked on uh, Star Wars way back in the day. I mean, like he's a legitimate talent. It was, apparently. Now he's working on shit like this. Well, it was. I think he died after this movie out of shame. Mm, he pro- probably caught a nice breeze and it did him in. That's what's killing people now, Bo. It, you're 100% <laughs> right. It's it's the air. Uh, so M. Night Shyamalan, of course, wrote, produced, and directed this thing, mm-hmm. which is the last credit you see. Written, produced, and directed by M. Night Shyamalan. And you're How like, dare you? What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> the master of the modern thriller, Chad, <laughs> has returned to, to scare us senseless. And so we open on Central Park. 830- Central Park, New York, Bo. Of course. Thanks for clarifying that title overlay. <laughs> right. It's not like you're going to say, like, you're in Rome, and you're like, oh, is this is this Rome, Italy, or Rome, Georgia? I think they both have <laughs> right. a St. Peter's Basilica and a surprising number of Dollar General stores. I'm a bit confused, honey. I think that drunk man's going to yell at those teenagers in a moment. <laughs> we need to get out of this movie. So <laughs> it is 8.33 a.m. Yes, thanks a lot, movie title <laughs> cards. That's a very specific time that the movie points out. Right, because in theory, the time matters. But it turns out, as like as with everything in this movie, it doesn't. No, they just forget about that shit halfway through. Well, yeah, and then at the end, it's like, guess what time it is? And you're like, oh, right, we were supposed to be checking our watches for this, because I certainly check my watch. At a certain point, the time overlays are like, afternoon, a little later. <laughs> yeah dinner ish <laughs> cocktail hour in the late <laughs> right so we see these two women and they're sitting on this bench in central park and i'm looking at this and i'm really hoping that the impractical jokers are going to come over and try to convince one of these women to read text on their phone from their ex-wife that the other jokers have written for them and each joker has to get the woman to read these texts and agree that the joker should go and propose to his ex-wife for a second time if the woman refuses to read the text then the jokers lose i gotta tell you i was with you till ex-wife and then i just couldn't i couldn't go that's a reference to true tv's impractical jokers a show that season after season peppers in more and more profanity much like pick six movies because you give the people what they want Bo. Mm -hmm. (gasps) that's what you do motherfucker the twist in this episode no profanity shit (laughs) oh damn it so lady number one Mm -hmm. on this bench Mm -hmm. is chatting about some book or something uh-huh. And then she's like, huh, did you hear something? Because off in the distance, somebody screams. And lady number two, whose name is Claire, is just staring uh, into nothing, not saying a word. And my first thought is, is she hung over? And mostly that's because when I did my notes, I was hung over. I like when the woman says, that is weird. Are those people over there clawing at themselves? Oh my God, is that blood? Am I the narrator? Did I write this movie? Am I M. Night Shyamalan? Am I the twist? Shit, is this movie over? Are these credits the the twist is that morgan freeman is the narrator little did they know trees were about to take their vengeance everybody in central park they're all walking around but then they stop walking and they freeze in place and they're not moving at all except for this one guy who starts walking backward and you hear billy jean is not my lover and he starts moonwalking Mm -hmm. i didn't really do that you remember when michael jackson did that for the first time on that uh that motown 25 year retrospective on tv and people lost their fucking mind uh, I do not remember that. I remember the moon dance being very, the very The moon popular. walk. Get it right, Bo. What? I, look, man. The moon dance. If you <laughs> ever thought I was even cool enough to like Michael Jackson mm-hmm. at the time Michael Jackson was popular, I'm like one of the three people of that era that did not own the album Thriller. I find that easy to believe. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was more into the police. But <laughs> what our friend Claire is into is taking her knitting needle or whatever is in the back of her hair, a hairpin, but it's one of those long ones, you know? Yeah. And then she starts saying, what page was I on? What page was I on? And her friend is like, Claire, what the fuck are you talking about? And then Claire just jabs the pin into her neck. Mm -hmm. And then we cut away from that because things were getting good. And this movie dares you, Chad, dares you to enjoy a scene. And then we cut over to the New York City streets. And this is, aside from the hilarity of 
Mark Wahlberg, which we will get into shortly. Mm -hmm. This is my favorite scene in the movie. The title overlay says three blocks from Central Park, comma, New York City, 8.59 a.m. In case you forgot where Central Park was from the first scene. We know where Central Park is. It's in New York. We're not stupid. But do you know where three blocks from Central Park is, Chad? That could be New Jersey. You know what? Anybody who saw this movie in the theater was probably a dumb dumb because they saw the village and the lady in the water. So outrage rescinded at this point. If you knew that the the same guy who did the village was doing this movie and you plunked down your money, then, you know, you're just asking for it. It's like people who go to coronavirus parties. At this point in the film, we are 23 minutes in the future and it was kind of weird being in the future Bo. you know it's like it's not like the past there's all these people walking around with their crazy ways and their clothes and their fashion is like what is that and then this guy comes in on a hoverboard and he calls a guy a bojo i don't even know what that means then someone else is like you got to have power <laughs> a bunch of construction workers <laughs> are listening to the welcome to jamaica joke which i'm glad at least they used a joke that i've heard before in Instead of just coming into a punchline that's like, and then she said, the water's running. Hang on a second here. This construction worker is just holding court, right? With his fellow co-workers. Yes. And none of them are working at all, which is what most construction workers appear to do when I walk by. And he says the punchline, which is, you have a girlfriend named Wendy too. I saw your thing and it said W-Y. And then the big guy says, no, man, mine says, welcome to Jamaica. Have a nice day. And I need to unpack a couple of things. Here, okay. This construction worker telling this humorous anecdote is a black man. And I think that's important, but I don't know why, though. And I watched this movie with my wife and I looked it over at her and I said, does that punchline make any sense to you at all? And I asked, have you ever heard this joke? Because my wife's name is Wendy. And she said, no, but she was able to explain the joke to me because I'm a simpleton and need others to at times detail why things are funny one step at a time, much in the same way I need a translator when watching The Big Bang Theory or The Goldbergs or that reboot boot of will and grace uh, full disclosure i've never watched an episode of any of those shows i conceptually understand that they're telling jokes on these shows and the laugh track lets me know when the joke ends but i am fundamentally unable to grasp what makes these moments laugh inducing and Bo, don't get up i'm just getting started here okay look Got it. my wife wendy who i adore and i love being quarantined with her in a house 24 hours a day explained to me that in the setup of this joke it involves two men who are peeing in a public restroom and they are most likely not there because of grinder, which is important because these two strangers observe each other's penises the way that straight men do when they're peeing in public. And during their look around observations of this public bathroom, these two individuals, they look at one another's cock so closely that they are able to identify any scars or blemishes. And in this case, tattoo marks that may be on one another's shaft. Now, the first person in this story the one establishing the premise of the joke, he tells the other man who is also in the joke that we are going to later find out in our punchline is from Jamaica and therefore I am presuming is also black, much like the construction worker who is spinning this humorous yarn from the outset. Well, Bo, the first man in our story looks over at the soon-to-be-find-out Jamaican man's penis and sees that his dick shaft has a W and a Y on it and our first man presumes that the tattoo on his penis is much like the tattoo on his own penis. Now, one can conjecture that the first man, the one instigating the framework for the final punchline of the quote joke unquote, his W and Y on his penis is the name of his wife that is in fact Wendy tattooed on his cock. And it is there perhaps at the bequest of his wife because she is fearful that her husband may be cheating on her and this is a way to state claim to her man and prevent other women from satisfying him sexually. Now, any man that is so taken with a woman to have her name tattooed on his own Johnson is truly involved in a relationship that should not be dismissed by some tawdry rest stop rub and tug. Now, back to our joke, when our primary entrant into this clever tale of merriment notices his newfound urinating friend also has a W and Y on his own penis. Now, their second man, who are we are going to find out is the source of the aforementioned punchline of the joke, we, the audience, are listening 
to for this delightful bit of fun. Here, the W and Y on his penis are actually truncated because his penis isn't erect. And the misunderstanding that the W and Y both represents the name Wendy is then hilariously revealed to us, the audience, when the man says that the W and Y represents welcome to Jamaica, have a nice day, because the second man, again, who I am assuming is black, is very proud of his nationality, or at the very least, the island country of Jamaica, and that he had this phrase tattooed across his very large ding dong with a message of welcome and goodwill to all that see his wiener when it is fully erect. This is truly a funny story of coincidence and national pride and bathroom urination curiosity between strangers who probably left that public toilet as friends and maybe one day lovers. That was so long and heavy with analysis, Gory Vidal should have written it. Hell! <laughs> And that is your Gore Vidal reference for the evening. But what's coming up on uh, the next episode of Pick 6 Movies? Oh, right. Uh, no, wait. We're still doing this one. We haven't even gotten to Mark Wahlberg yet. What's funny, though, Chad, <laughs> is that I think of that Welcome to Jamaica joke probably once every, uh, probably once every couple of months. What bathrooms are you going to? It's not because I'm in a bathroom. It's just one of those jokes that I heard at a formative age where it was like, oh, I get it. That joke's about a dick. And it captured my imagination. You and I were once in a public bathroom, not trolling for sex. And well, uh, one of we us both wasn't. In, shh, we both went in to pee, and I pulled the old man. This water's cold. And then you just backhanded it and said, "Yeah, it's deep too." Yeah, it's a fantastic joke. <laughs> that's a that's a Richard Pryor joke. That's the mud bone joke. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, piss jokes. Yeah. I, anytime you can engage someone in a public restroom, uh, I'm for it. I like making friends at a urinal. Sometimes I just <laughs> step up to the urinal and I, I announce to any and all in the bathroom, Hello, everyone. My name is Bo, and I'm here for you. That has led to some awkward conversations, but it also led to a lifelong friendship with my friend Tony. Anyway, this Welcome to Jamaica joke teller is finishing up his joke and everybody's having a good hearty laugh about it. It's funny. Yeah, right? As well, they should. And then you see in the background, this dude just fly through the frame and, and crash to the earth. And somebody's like, hey, did you hear something? Holy shit. Mackenzie just fell. How is the song It's Raining Men by the 1980s musical duo The Weather Girls not playing during this scene? It's a real missed opportunity, Bo. Here's, uh, once again, a note comparison from your friends at Pick 6 Movies. <laughs> and I quote from my notes, then it literally starts raining men. So yeah, after Mackenzie, after they rush over to him and they're like, hey, what the fuck happened to Mackenzie? And then, as you said, it starts <laughs> raining men. Hallelujah. And it is glorious, man. It, they look up and it's just a bunch of construction workers coming off of the 17th floor of this in construction high rise. Yeah, they're just pouring from the sky and just rocketing towards the ground until they bounce to their death. Which, Bo, if I ever fall off a building, I want that to be listed as my cause of death. Tell people that I bounced to death. <laughs> or, or you can tell them that gravity killed me. You know what? Or you can say Earth violently albeit unintentionally, took my life. If I go like this, Chad, I want you to make sure that my tombstone, the epitaph there, is that Butch Cassidy line of, it's the fall that killed him. P.S. He couldn't swim. <laughs> Another problem with the, the scene, even though it's my favorite of the movie, you know that with both McKenzie and then Davis, who they point out has has jumped off the building, that fifth floor ain't ever getting done, Chad. No. I like that the foreman goes, oh, God. And it's not that he's really worried about them being dead. It really feels like this is going to be so much paperwork. Right. Oh, geez. I'm going to have to talk to my supervisor who's going to talk to his supervisor. And I ain't <laughs> never getting off work today. But then, Chad, the movie shifts to the real star of this movie, the star yes. of this movie. And <laughs> it is science teacher Mark Wahlberg. Now, let those mm -hmm. words sink in for a second. Science teacher Mark Wahlberg. He is standing in front of a class of high school students in science class, and he's wearing this sleeveless V-neck sweater with a collared shirt underneath, sleeves rolled up, blue jeans, because he's the cool teacher, and he's teaching science. And the movie gives us another title card to let us know that we're in Philadelphia High School, comma, Philadelphia. In case Philadelphia High School threw you, 
We might be in Philadelphia, Mississippi. You know, there's one there, too. Maybe. Oh, wait, never mind. Who knows, bro? They got them everywhere. And the the movie also tells us it is now 9.45 a.m. Everyone, set your watches and mark. So Mark Wahlberg, science teacher. Marky Mark. Is pitching to the class a real head scratcher. Oh, my God. And he says... Look, I was reading this article in the Atlantic about all the honeybees going away. Where'd they go, bro? Come on, give me some theories, everybody. Because he has no clue. He has no idea. And he's genuinely, I think, looking for good information here. This shit is crazy, bro. Bees are disappearing and there's no trace of them. There's no bodies. There's no honey. There's nothing, bro. How are they going to make honey nut Cheerios? Think about that. That's the best Cheerio there is. It's honey and nuts together. It's a honey oven. Oh, it's honey nut Cheerios. It's scary. Think about it. I called my buddy Mark Harmon. He's on NCIS. I was like, hey, you got to get them NCISs over here. Marky Mark's class just sits in stunned silence because let's be honest, Marky Mark is their science teacher. It would be like having Shaggy 2 Dope from the insane clown posse teaching you geometry what universe am i in wait let's hit the brakes for a second speaking of what universe am i in where did you get the name of shaggy dudo from insane clown posse i know you do not own an icp album i got it off my forearm tattoo oh (laughs) all right well let's break out the was it shasta fanta is that the thing fago i guess you really are a juggalo i had no idea this is a side of you i never knew there's a weird set of woods near my house. <laughs> Here's the Q&A that Marky Mark has set up, which is, where did all the honeybees go? And then somebody says, oh no, maybe a virus or something? He goes, no, bro, it's in all 48 states. You got to think about these things. Shut the fuck up. And then someone's like, what about pollution? He goes, yeah, but there are no bodies. If it were pollution, that pollution would be knocking them right out of the sky. We'd be stepping on honeybees all over the place. Yeah, it's like Bigfoots. You ever seen a dead Bigfoot? Me neither. Sasquatch is a myth, bro. I don't care what the Travel Channel says. Everybody knows Bigfoots eat their own. That's why you never see the bodies. He is basically a stupid Columbo, where he is using this Socratic method (laughs) to tease information out of his students. And then one one of his real (laughs) dumbass, Dylan, is the name of this kid. Uh, he's a real nerd. He's like, well, how about global warming? And Marky Mark's like, maybe, maybe so. Dylan, yawn is something, but we can't say it from yes. To and then he goes to Jake and he's like, Jake, look, you're a good looking kid. Nobody's arguing that. You got a nice face. You got a pretty good package. I mean, I've never seen it up close, but I see the bulge and you got to be packing something. You know, I got famous because my underwear models and the reason people really liked it. I got a big cock. You could see it right there in the underwear ads. I would have billboards <laughs> and everything. I'm a science teacher. Those good looks and those perfect teeth of yours and your hair and your your cheekbones. You know what? Those things are going to get your foot in the door. They may not keep you in the room, but it's definitely going to work to your advantage. And look, now your face, it's perfect and you're 15 years old. And I know this sounds like I'm coming on to you, bro, but stick with me. Look, the human nose and ears grow like a fraction of an inch every year over time. And your perfect face is going to balloon up like a jack-o'-lantern. And if you're lucky, you might get a job, you know, working as one of those professional snugglers where people pay you money to come in the homes and lay next to him while they rub up next to you and kiss your ear you know Dude, if i may the way that he puts this is you might look whack in 10 years <laughs> <laughs> which is a real showstopper when you're watching a movie and the science teacher uses the word whack and only in movies like dangerous minds or stand and deliver where the teacher's trying to get down to the kid's level <laughs> do you expect the word <laughs> whack to pop up but then Jake, our our handsome young man, says, oh, no, maybe it's just an act of nature. And we're never going to know. And because <laughs> Marky Mark is a scientist, he goes, that's totally right, dude. His answer is essentially, I don't know, right? It's even worse than that. The way he puts it is, you know, they're going to put some reason in the textbooks, bro. But you know what? Science is mostly make them ups and guesswork. We're never going to know. And you're like, wait a second. All these facts, bro, they're just made up bullshit. We don't know anything. How do you even know that the world is round? Maybe it's flat. You ever seen it from out of space? Think about that shit. You know, I'm going to go put this on the internet. I'm going to see what other people think about it, bro. It's the most scientific of principles. Hey, it's kind of hot to understand. Maybe we shouldn't even try. You know what? Giving vaccines to 
of babies. Maybe it causes these little kids to lose their minds. I heard that from my brother Donnie's wife, Jenny, just the other day. She was telling me that all the chemicals in the water are the reason there's so many gay people now, you know? These are all facts that I'm spreading to anybody who doesn't know what a fact is, bro. Follow me on YouTube. Smash that like button, bro. <laughs> Marky Mark then addresses the real issue in the room, which is Jake saying like, is that true about my nose and ears? That's really fucked up. And he's like, I'm, I'm just messing with you, bro. You're going to be a hot throb your whole life. And this is the point where I was like, I think he really is coming on to him. <laughs> About this time, the vice principal comes into the classroom and Marky Mark is trying to endear himself to his students and he kind of hunkers down and hides while he says, yo, bro, it's the Dark Lord. Don't look in her eyes, bro. And as he's kind of creeping around the room, he goes over and turns off the classroom lights. And Marky Mark really comes off as a loser in this movie. A loser or a drunk. If my teacher did this in a classroom, Chad, if we were in high school and we we, we had a couple of classes together and uh -huh. one of our teachers did this shit we would never stop mocking it <laughs> no it, it would drain the respect you had for this person forever you'd end up just throwing their plants on the floor you wouldn't show up to class crazy. anymore yeah. like i'm not learning from you look at you right i watched one of your youtube videos and it was stupid as shit i can't learn anything from you the vice principal just turns the classroom lights back on and says can we please just not for once do this kind of stupid shit marky mark i need to talk to you and so the class gives it a good old-fashioned and Marky Mark looks back at his class and he says, hey, calm down. This is serious. I'll be back. Hey, you guys think of some more stupid bee theories. Like, why can't a bee get elected president of the United States? I want you to write that one down. Okay, guys. Also, Jake, before I leave, how about you take off your shirt? <laughs> and so they they head to the hallway and they, they're passing a few classrooms. And as they pass by one of them, there are a bunch of kids like gathering around, you know, a phone, checking out the news, one presumes. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that all the teachers have gathered in the gym to talk mm -hmm. to Cameron from Ferris Bueller, a.k.a. Yes. Alan Ruck. He's in front of the staff and he says, look, everyone, this is George Peterson. We've had a bit of bad luck this morning, as you may have heard. It's been a rough morning and we got a lot of family business to take care of. So if you wouldn't mind excusing Sloan from school, I'd, uh, I'd appreciate it. I'm sorry. Actually, what he says is we've had a bit of a happening this morning. Central Park in New York City and New York State was hit by a terrorist attack. Seeing as this movie takes place four years after 9-11, feel free to gasp and in shock stand there in disbelief. And then all of the teachers, they gasp and stand there in shock and, you know, they're full of disbelief. Right. Well, and he tells them there are three stages of this suspected attack mm -hmm. that whatever toxin they've released. He's right. like, first, there's crazy talk. Mm -hmm. Two, disorientation. And third is fatal. At present, Spider-Man is on the case and authorities are trying to track down Doc Ock, a.k.a. Dr. Otto Octavius, as well as someone called the Scarecrow. Sir, that's a different movie and you're referencing villains from both the Marvel and DC Universe. Hey, shut up, nerd. As I was saying before being rudely interrupted, I have word that Commissioner Gordon has informed me that Batman is on the case and solomon grundy and clayface are currently at large sir again this is not a superhero movie shut up nerd also clayface is a c-tier villain at best probably probably not going to be involved in something like this you're probably looking at your your jokers maybe your two faces definitely not a clayface sir look this movie doesn't have joker money all right now look pay attention public school teachers here's what i do know after everyone goes through these three random stages of being slurred with speech and disoriented physically the third stage is picking up a bottle of early time and trying not to text dick pics to your ex-wife. Am I right, everyone, who's disappointed how their life turned out? Marky Mark at this point is like, wait a second, bro. Central Park? That was the target? That's pretty weird. Aren't we in Philly? Like, he's puzzling over the fact that, like, boy, why'd they attack a park? That seems real strange. Look, Marky Mark, people are dead in New York City. Citizens have died and you insult me? What the hell? hell's the matter with you anyway pardon my french marky mark but you're an asshole <laughs> this isn't over yet buster do you read me marky mark is like oh bro he's gonna keep calling and calling 
<laughs> so Marky Mark fucks off back to his classroom. They've dismissed school. Like he's like, you know, schools are closed. And Marky Mark goes back to his class to give the kids the good news. And then Hooray! as the, <laughs> they're leaving, he's like, he makes them recite essentially the scientific method, you know, like experiment, hypothesize and shit like that. And then as they're leaving, he says, you know what, kids? And they all stop and look at him. Uh-huh. And he just goes, you know what? It's nothing. And I think he was about to tell Jake that he loved him. That is my oh. pet theory. Because there's no no indication of what he was going to tell him. Was he going to, like, by the way, bro, there's this three-stage toxin that's out there. You got to be careful. I thought he was just going to go back to the missing bees well one more time. You know, like, guys, seriously, you got any other ideas what's going on with these missing bees? I mean, that's a real thick pickle, ain't it? You know? Also, I got to tell you, I'm missing my dog Lucky. I don't know where he went. Anybody got a theory on that one? If anyone has a line on maybe where Shih Tzu went, let me know. Jake, what's your thoughts on that thick pickle? Huh? Speaking of thick pickles, how about you drop those pants? Let me see what those skivvies are holding. <laughs> we, as he tells him to beat it, there's this close up on the chalkboard, which is Einstein's quote about how you know if if bees disappear, then human beings are gonna follow in four years or something like that. This movie tries to get real high minded with you, but don't kid yourself. This movie's stupid as shit. It says attributed to Albert Einstein. What does that mean? It means that Marky Mark made it up, put it on his YouTube channel, and then was like, <laughs> you know who I think said that? Albert Einstein. You ever had anything attributed to you? I mean, one child in a case of herpes. I, I was thinking the stink in the bathroom every now and again. Oh, no, man. I take care of that. I, I like eat a lot of garlic and rose Ooh. petals. Did you ever see that animated movie by Jerry Seinfeld called Bee Movie, where he voices a character that's a bee that wants to fuck a real-life woman? I did. That That's a weird movie. That movie turns into a courtroom drama halfway through for no good reason. <laughs> what the fuck was that movie about? That was one of the most like miscalculated films of all time. Somebody should do a podcast where they talk about that movie. <laughs> eh, probably wouldn't be very good. Or it would be the fifth best podcast of something. And anyway, so Marky Mark then goes to hook up with uh, his buddy, not hook up, but, you know, meet John Leguizamo. Uh Jake. Oh, sorry. No, not Jake. Jake. uh, Sadly, we don't see Jake in this movie anymore, but you know that Marky Mark cranked it at least once. He's thinking about him. Oh, of course. All the time. I mean, look at his Mm -hmm. relationship with Zoe Deschanel. I mean, Uh it's clear that his love is pointed a different direction. But John Leguizamo pops in. He's dressed up like Billy Crystal in this movie, except he doesn't have his beard. Yeah, where he's, oh, no. Uh, (laughs) Oh, no. My mother's hysterical. Uh, Oh, no. (laughs) Hello? He's like, hey, uh, oh, my mother, she was hysterical. I had to throw her some numbers. And Marky Mark is like, what are you talking about, bro? Did you actually throw numbers at her? I don't even know how that would work. How did you make them real? Did you just imagine them? And John Lee was almost like, oh, no, you're an idiot. And he's like, no, people are soothed by percentages. And John Lee was almost like, so uh, I'm going to go up there. We're going to dig for Ipswich clams. (laughs) Again, this podcast is for like three people. But he says, like, she still wants me to go up there. Uh, Do you want to come with maybe Alma? (laughs) Your Billy Crystal is a lot like your M.M.M. Walsh. A little bit. There's a little bit of M.M.M. Walsh in there. (laughs) It's it's subtle. It's That's the M.M.M. Walsh. And as the Billy Crystal is more of a... So you got to tune you. your ear just right. Uh, it's a tonal language. Yeah. It's like the uh, Darmok episode of Next Generation. <laughs> it's all. <laughs> Again, I don't, I don't even know who we're doing this show for, for anymore <laughs> with this combination of references. But so Marky Mark is like, yeah, bro, I should call Alma. I haven't even thought about it this whole movie yet. And then he calls up Alma on his cell phone, who is uh, Zoe Deschanel. We don't really get into that mess too much because outside the kids are getting on buses and John Leguizamo is like, hey, I'm going to meet you and Alma at the station. And Mark says, listen, bro, if we get there and Alma's acting a little weird, I need you to be cool, bro. All right. John Leguizamo is like, oh, no, is she leaving you? (laughs) 
hey, bro, look, it's just talk. She isn't leaving me, okay? She's just talking about leaving me. There's a big difference between those things, all right? Yeah, he's like... Oh, no. I never told you this. I saw her crying on her wedding day. She did not look fabulous. <laughs> oh, man. I wish John Luke was over where this movie more. <laughs> so we cut it from this over to Alma, which is a name that <laughs> no one has had. These are all references from one season of Saturday Night Live. <laughs> and the movie Running Scared. And I think there's some city slickers in there. there That's I, it. A little a little slice, yeah. We cut over to Alma, who is just staring doe-eyed and confused at the television. Is this Zoe Deschanel? Is that her yes. character's name? Yes. Oh, uh, this is the him. Alma he was supposed to be calling. The phone rings, and she sees the name Joey on her cell phone. Uh-huh. And instead of just, you know, sending the call to voicemail or something, she, like, throws it aside. Like, huh. <laughs> <laughs> like the the phone itself was gonna answer and j- she would have no choice but to talk to this joey character right marky mark comes in and he's like yo bro what's going on and zoe de chanel she says hey they're evacuating the city if you can believe it why don't we sit down indian style and make daisy chains together and we can watch wnn the world news network that is in no way affiliated with a real life cable news network called cnn a reporter from WNN, definitely not CNN, God, enough is like, hey, there's these neurotransmitters that are doing a who's it's that blocks self-preservation. And that's where Zoe Deschanel says, oh, it makes you kill yourself. Wow. Just when you thought there couldn't be any more evil in the world to be invented. And I was like, she just said there couldn't be more evil invented in the world, which made me think, do you remember that episode of Saturday Night Live where Dwayne The Rock Johnson played an evil scientist who invented a child molesting robot? Yes. That was pretty good. That is a pretty good sketch. Also something that feels wildly inappropriate. Considering the fact that he's starring in an upcoming Disney movie based on the Jungle Cruise. Or every Disney movie. Moana and I'm sure those Fast and Furious movies are tied to Disney somehow. Everything's tied to Disney somehow. I mean, they own everything. You, me, everything. I got a letter in the mail the other day from Mickey Mouse that's like, hey, we're taking your your house, asshole. I'm like, oh, well, I mean, Uh, he would know. Yeah, you fucking racist rat. I saw that Steamboat Willie shit. That's not funny. <laughs> Sorry, don't mean to bite the end that feeds. Uh, Marky Mark is like, yeah, bro, it's fucking crazy out there. I'll tell you what, I'm going to go upstairs and pack. We need to get the fuck out of here. And he goes upstairs, throws a bunch of, uh, of shit together, but he grabs this mood ring uh-huh. that you think is going to be really important to the film and never is. Ah, I mean, it comes back. It comes back, but so does John Leguizamo, and he's not, he's, John Leguizamo is equally important as this mood ring, and the mood ring lasts longer than he does. Agreed. We do get a shot of a newspaper headline that says, Philadelphia murder rate soaring. And I'm thinking, this movie is about a mystery gas that makes you kill yourself, not other people. And this headline isn't focused on today's activities. It's focused on yesterday's news. We don't need to hear about the murder rates in Philadelphia. Also, that headline made me think of flip, flip, Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> So while Marky Mark is packing up his mood ring and, and checking the newspaper, Zoe Deschanel gets another call from uh, Joey. Uh-huh. And she immediately hangs up on, oh. And then does this innocent look like she's three and got caught with her hand in the cookie jar. Where she's like, mm-hmm. oh, nothing. How about we just, you know, I brought some bongos. We can make a song. <laughs> and so they take off to the train station. Where Marky Mark finds uh, John Leguizamo. He's there with his daughter, Jess. Right. And they catch another news report because this whole front end of the movie is nothing but news reports giving us exposition. Latest information on the toxic scare. It's centered in New York City. New York, New York. Captain America and the Flash are on the case or some bullshit. What? And, well, and the only thing you get out of this really is like, oh, they don't think it's a terrorist attack anymore. They think it's a natural compound. Um, and, which, again, th- this leads to the stupid-ass theory that we come up with, which it turns out is the real stupid-ass thing happening in this movie. And John Leguizamo's wife, uh, he's like, oh, no, she didn't make it. Um, but they have Jess with them. Mm-hmm. And this is where Zoe Deschanel is like, um, Marky Mark, can I just talk to you for a minute? 
And then pulls him aside and she's like, so uh, I was thinking maybe I'd just sit alone for a while because I'm kind of a messy bitch that likes drama. And so she just grabs a ticket from his hand is like, yoink, and then heads for the train, which... I get. Doesn't she also call out Marky Mark and she's like, hey, did you tell John Leguizamo about the fight we had the other day? I thought that kind of stuff was private. Yeah, he's like, yo, bro, look, I mean, he's my friend. I tell him about fights we have. What do you want to do? I tell him about personal things. I told him about Jake. I told you about Jake. You know, this is the kind of thing that I'm going to journal about later tonight using a quill and an inkwell. Look, bro, if you're still up for that threesome with Jake, all you got to do is give me a thumbs up. You don't even have to say nothing. It doesn't even have to be a threesome. It could be a twosome. You could watch. You could leave, you know, me and Jake. Put down like that. I'll tell you what. All you got to do is stop the video recorder and leave the room. You don't have to watch nothing, but I definitely want a record. Before you put the tape in, just right on the outside of it, thick pickle, and I'll know exactly what it is. That thing's going up in the amateur section is spang bang in like 20 minutes bro once youtube is invented i'm definitely gonna start making money off this stuff i'm telling you all the money i made in underwear ads i think me and jake could make a mint together so meanwhile chad at rittenhouse park in philadelphia trees start (laughs) ominously rustling (laughs) i mean that's i swear to christ that's what happens in this movie there's a shot of just trees like And it is 1131 a.m. where we see people walking around the park with their dogs and they're throwing Frisbee and buying drugs and exposing themselves and soliciting sex from undercover police officers. You know, Bo, all the things you do in a public park. Yeah, You don't have to tell me, Chad. And then all of a sudden people just stand still. It's like the worst improv everywhere that you've ever not wanted to be a part of. And also you get at least one person in every group of these standing still people who just starts trucking backwards you know i thought you meant the one that kind of like wavers a little and you're like you're not doing it right i said stand still (laughs) and then we there's a cop that's kind of wandering amongst the people and he just shoots himself in the head Uh uh-huh which again happens kind of off screen like you you see his what feet or whatever Uh and then he falls and you see the bullet hole in his head and then somebody else comes along and it's a cab driver right a dude gets out of his cab grabs the gun he shoots himself and then you see another woman coming over to grab the gun and you're Uh like wait a second he's never gonna have enough bullets for all this what are the rest of these people gonna do to kill themselves are they just waiting till the bullets run out and they're like well i guess i just gotta pick up a rock and brain myself to death or whatever i think they just hold the gun by the barrel and start smacking themselves in the head with the butt of the gun <laughs> it's all they all use the same gun however they can one of them chokes on it one person <laughs> shoves it up their ass and dies of rectal bleeding <laughs> this whole scene reminded me of the finale of that movie pin and teller get killed remember where all those people keep coming in the room and committing suicide by shooting themselves yeah that's an arthur pin movie that's pretty good it is he directed the chase with marlon brando and robert redford not that shitty version of the chase we reviewed last season with charlie sheen Shitty version, Chad. Did you see the people uh, responding on Facebook about how great the movie was who never have listened to our show? <laughs> Love this movie. Love it. You you clearly don't listen to me. <laughs> this movie is the best. <laughs> uh, all right. Never saw any better. Yeah. Okay. Flea was in this. I We know. We did a whole show. <laughs> this one has cars. Like... <laughs> So we're back on the train and everybody is not sitting together (laughs) because all these tickets were in short supply. And Zoe Deschanel, she's off by herself and her phone rings and it's the mystery suitor, Joey. And she picks it up and uh, she says, hey, Joey, you have got to stop calling me on my phone, okay? You're acting like the fatal attraction guy here, which is actually the victim in that movie. So my analogy makes very little sense. And to continue that theme of bad analogies, let me say that i'm expecting to see you and your silhouette outside of a shower curtain which didn't even happen in the movie fatal attraction i'm really confusing all of this with the movie psycho and then she acts all surprised when he uh apparently joey uh who by the way joey played by m9 Shyamalan in this movie he's good oh 
boy, you you can tell he really brings it in this film. And but he he tells Zoe Deschanel that people are taking turns shooting themselves mm-hmm. in Philadelphia. Wow, <laughs> wow, what is new about that? <laughs> <laughs> it's called Philadelphia for a reason, Joey. <laughs> kill, kill, Philadelphia. <laughs> and then we cut back to the car where Marky Mark has been banished by Zoe Deschanel to hang out with John Leguizamo, who is calling his wife, and he's like, "Oh no, I can't hear you, honey. Yeah, why don't?" Oh, just try to text. And Mar- Marky Mark is then surprised to hear from another passenger who's like, hey, that w- the stuff that happened in Philadelphia started in a park also. Uh-huh. And Marky Mark's like, hey, bro, I'm starting to put two and two together here. I really think that parks have something to do with all this. And then John Leguizamo gets a text from his wife and he's like, oh, no, she's on a bus to Jersey. And Marky Mark is like, that's fucked up, bro. That place stinks like the high heaven. I mean, have you ever been there? The place smells like God's armpit. I got to tell you, I'm trying to make a little time with Jake. He's never going to meet me there. Jake's got a lot of good options. I'm like one of three. Marky Mark is like, look, bro, I, I got to beat this scene for a second. And goes up to the car to find Do- Zoe Deschanel. And she's like, oh, I heard it hit, hit Boston, too. Oh, my God, bro. What did you hear that? And Zoe Deschanel says, um, my friend from work, Joe, uh, Joe, Joe, Josephine, who I've never had sex with, uh, told me that Boston was hit. And I'm going to change the subject now. What is up with John Leguizamo's wife? You know, they have that little girl, Jess, and, and she should be with both of her parents to protect her in any sort of difficult situation not with us oh you effectively distracted me and then she's like hey what's going on anyway zoe disho looks at marky mark and she says yeah marky mark what is going on here and marky mark says honestly bro i don't know and she asks him because he is a science teacher in a high school she really thinks that marky mark has some sort of hidden cache of knowledge but i want you to think about every high school teacher that you had in high school did any of them have any idea what was going on at all really no the most memorable one had anorexia I, I was gonna say bulimia and her breath smelled like an asshole shit it smelled like god's armpit have you ever been to new jersey bo i have and it does smell like uh, god's armpit we had a few openly racist teachers on a myriad of subjects we had one guy in our high school that i'm pretty sure was having sex with female students back when everything was all hush hush and on the qt i remember when i was in seventh grade bo my homeroom teacher read us the novelette the children's story by james clavel which is about a classroom full of kids who get their overall ideas and beliefs changed by a teacher that was in control of the class for a mere 20 minutes and in this book this new teacher comes in and dismisses the old teacher and then just like takes over the class and starts asking questions like why would you pledge allegiance to the flag what does the flag represent hey shouldn't we all have a piece of the flag who's got some scissors let's cut up the flag and then by the end of the story all of the kids have abandoned their religion and national loyalty and the whole story is meant to show how easily children and people can be persuaded through the introduction of new ideas but at the time like i'm in seventh grade and i'm sitting there thinking you know what this guy makes a lot of sense hey somebody grab some scissors and let's cut up the flag you don't have to tell me twice chad By the way, there's no God, anybody. Yeah, let's start with Santa Claus and work our way through the fantasies. The most believable line of dialogue in this movie is when he says, Look, bro, I have no idea what's going on. (laughs) That's true. So the train then stops in Filbert, Pennsylvania. (laughs) Is that the Night Court theme? What are you doing? That was my planes, trains, and automobiles. Oh, okay. I'm with you now. So... The train stops there, and Marky Mark confronts the train employees who have gathered outside of the train. Mm Mm-hmm. In Filbert, Pennsylvania, Bo. Right. So, Marky Mark goes to confront this, you know, huddle of train employees who are all dressed like Looney Tunes train employees. (laughs) Yes. With, like, the red caps and whatnot. Mm Mm-hmm. Looks like the Polar Express without all the delicious hot chocolate. Yeah, or the eerie, uncanny valley uh, representations of humanity. (laughs) And they're they're communing together and Marky Mark is like, hey, bro, what the fuck's up with stopping their train? What are we going to do? And they're like, look, uh, we got to level with you 
for no reason. Yeah, we've been trying to get in touch with people, uh, you know, like our bosses and, well, the rest of the world, and we can't. So we decided to just stop the train and kick everyone the fuck off. <laughs> is their grand scheme yo bro why are you telling me this all right you're giving me one useless piece of information at a time what's going on here bro right and they're just like yeah best of luck i guess uh with your attempts to escape this potential disaster that's unfolding yeah the conductors are like uh sir it's actually not useless information taken one piece at a time each individual piece of information is in and of itself singularly important and then taken as a whole they construct a larger idea which is part of a broader theme that leads to an overarching concept that is truth and this truth is light and this light is freedom now try to grab this pebble from my hand whoa 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 bro look i'm a science teacher i know science and science is all crazy make em ups what you're saying is it's just science. <laughs> Marky Mark says, you can't just leave us here, bro. And then the one conductor says, sir, we lost contact. And Marky Mark says, with whom? And the conductor says, everyone. And I know that this was the first time that Mark Wahlberg has ever used the word whom in a grammatically correct sentence. Right. Other times it's just like... Hey, who went into the liquor store to get all the all the wine coolers? I specifically said strawberry and somebody's showing up with peach. Whom stole the cookies from the cookie jar? Whom you? Whom me? Hey, guys, I ran into this guy down at the bus station. You're never going to guess whom. Knock, knock. Who's, who's there? there? <laughs> Check out that owl. Whom, whom. Everybody shut the fuck up. One of my favorite movies is coming on. It's guess whom coming to dinner. I love this movie. <laughs> This white guy's going to learn a lesson. You just watch, bro. You know what my favorite Bill Murray movie is, bro? Whom about Bob? It's so funny, dude. The guy from Jaws is just, he's in a tizzy by the end of that thing. It's like my favorite band, The Whom. <laughs> they won't get fooled again. You know what book I just read? For Who the Bell Tolls. <laughs> Yeah, that's the twist. So John Leguizamo <laughs> lies to his daughter and and is like, oh, we're safe. And then Zoe Deschanel is, is talking to Jess, the daughter, and is like, oh, I totally understand where you're coming from. I don't like to openly express my emotions either, in case anyone missed that when I was talking about it earlier at the station. Yeah, that's why I was cast in this movie, because I'm incapable of expressing emotion. Look at me. <laughs> I'm like a mannequin that's able to move its arms and legs on its own. It is worth saying that Zoe Deschanel in this movie might as well be wood pulp. She has so little like expression in this mm -hmm. film. And I don't know. I don't I haven't seen enough of her work to really know if she's a good actress or not. But boy, you couldn't tell by this movie because she doesn't do shit. Nah, she didn't do a whole lot in this. She's not given a whole lot to do. So not her fault. Uh, I mean, she throws phones and tries not to look guilty for fucking somebody. Right, and that's the stuff where you're like, oh, I don't think uh, maybe you're not good. But she didn't fuck the guy. She had cake with him. Oh, 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 it was tiramisu. Um, <laughs> Marky Mark shows up and is like, yo, bro, the train people aren't saying shit. This one guy back there tried to teach me Kung Fu and show me a path to enlightenment. And I told him, look, I already know science, all right? And facts and shit like that. Yo, Jess, little girl, you look scary. You know what? Don't worry. We're in this small town, Filbert. If movies have taught me anything, you know, nothing bad ever happens to people from big cities when they unexpectedly find themselves in a rural small town with no means of transportation to get out. It's a fact. It's a science fact. I'm a science teacher, bro. Don't forget that, all right? You ever see Children of the Corn? You're going to be just fine, Jess. You're probably going to sacrifice to somebody, to he whom walks behind the rose <laughs> we cut to a very crowded diner where marky mark is sitting with jess and john leguizamo heads over to this mob of people at this other counter to get his kid a glass of milk and zoe deschanel she's in line for the ladies room which when the door opens up to this lady's bathroom it looks like a full-sized master bedroom inside that just happens to have a toilet over in the corner ah those women's rooms are always way nicer than the men's rooms i guess so Back over at the other counter, Jess, she's looking pretty worried because her mom is off somewhere on a bus. Poor lady. And her dad's trying to get her some milk. So now it's time for Marky Mark to shine and make this scared child feel a whole lot better. So the way he does that is he's like, listen, bro, this is science because I'm making a lot of this up right now. So everyone has their own energy, bro. Look, here's this mood ring. Put it on. 
And so she puts it on and it turns yellow and he goes, oh my God, yellow means you're about to laugh, bro. And this is about the level of science we've come to expect from him at this point. And he gets interrupted from making this child feel better about herself, kind of, by a nearby patron who's like, hey, look at this video. Uh huh. Dude, there is a, a dude at a zoo. Mm-hmm. Uh, on on the the phone video who goes into this lion's den at the local zoo one presumes the pennsylvania philadelphia zoo probably around 9 47 a.m and we don't see anything initially because this movie doesn't seem to know why we're all here and then finally we get this hysterical look at this dude who is like trying to present himself as food to the lions Mm -hmm. and when we cut back to him one of his arms is gone Mm -hmm. and the a lion is taking the other one off Dude, this lion tears his arm off as though it is attached by dental floss and spit. His arm comes off as easily as Phil Hartman's arms were ripped off when he was doing the deadlift event as part of the all-drug Olympic sketch on Saturday Night Live. Yes, the only other suitable example is the Black Knight from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Yeah. It is that level of just arms falling off. The kicker is that the woman who's showing Marky Mark this video, her response is, Mother of God, what kind of terrorist are these? Like, how is this a terrorist attack? A man putting his arm in a tiger's mouth and the arm is covered in tiger sauce or something? (laughs) Delicious, delicious human juice. Which is also what I call my sweat. Human juice. (laughs) And John Leguizamo looks like he might have an idea or something, and then we cut away before any of that is ever realized. And then we cut back to the diner, but it's later. And it's a news report, again, telling us like, Hey, here in Gotham, I mean Philadelphia, we believe that a terrorist act seems less and less likely. Not the joke of this time, folks. Then they show a map of the northeastern United States, and there's all these dots where they think something's happening. And this guy who was on the train just yells out, where are we? Then then a diner worker goes up and points his finger to where Scranton, Pennsylvania is in the upper northeast part of the state. And that's not where they are at all. They're over going west of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Like, no one in this diner understands basic geography. And then at this point, some other diner just stands up and shouts out, I think his name was John Q. Calls a panic. This guy goes, If we stay here, we're all going to die here. And everyone just turns into the Muppet Show and they just start screaming and throwing chickens and pigs and confetti around. And they just run out like it's the final act of it's a mad, 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 mad world. Or the uh, inferior rat race. If you're of a certain age. But yeah, like everybody just takes the fuck off. (laughs) Leaving our heroes, question mark, behind. And as they get outside, this greasy looking guy who runs the local nursery. No, not the kids kind. The plant Uh, kind. Says, oh, I can give you a ride. We got to stop by the house for a second. I got to pick up a handle of beam and beef jerky sticks. Bo, in all fairness to the movie, he's going back to his nursery to pick up some hot dogs. Yeah, I ended up referring to this guy in my notes as the hot dog chef because he is way too obsessed with hot dogs throughout the film. He looks like Tommy Chong's much younger distant brother. There's an actor he looks a lot like. I can't think of his name. He looks uh, like the dude from Real Genius that uh, went through the steam tunnels. Laszlo Olifeld, you mean? Mm-hmm. He won that Frito-Lay contest. He won 87% of all the prizes, including mm-hmm. the car. His calculations are off prize. a little bit. He's going to have to go back and check that. <laughs> <laughs> now I just want to listen to One Night Love Affair and dance with student <laughs> beauticians. But he says, like, hey, I can give you a ride. And uh, John Leguizamo goes, oh, no, I'm going to go to Princeton to look for my wife. There's this guy over here in a red Jeep, and he's headed to some places where my wife might be since I can't get her on the phone. So, Jess, my one and only little girl, I'm going to leave you here with these two other people while I head off with strangers. Not two people. These two idiots. He is leaving his daughter with the least capable people in the film. John Leguizamo's character is a terrible father in this movie. No parent is going to get separated from their child at a time like this. 
terrible parent or genius, Chad, because I propose that John Leguizamo's plan the whole time is like, this is his chance to step out for a pack of smokes. He can get rid of his wife and the kid in one fell swoop. At this point, Marky Mark's face just screams, are you kidding me, bro? I'm not taking your kid. And then Zoe Deschanel, she chimes in, hey, this will be super fun, Jess. I've always wanted a daughter. I mean, a little sister like you. We can sing songs and dance around in poodle skirts and crinoline a little bit later. She takes the kid's hand and John Leguizamo, for no good reason, just gets real with her for a second. Uh He's like, oh, hey, don't take my daughter's hand unless you mean it. And she's like, oh, well, oh, I mean it, I guess. I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's so many things going on right now. My head's just a whirlwind of emotions and thoughts. And I guess I mean it. I don't know. And he's just like, eh, that's good enough. And then he just runs off after this Jeep. I like how the Jeep slowly pulls away and then waits and then pulls away and waits. It's like a sadistic ice cream man. Like, I'm going. I'm stopping. No, I'm leaving. Now nah, wait. Right. <laughs> then you get there. All they've got is rainbow pops. And it was never worth it to begin with. Did you see who was driving the red Jeep? I did not. It was uh, Brian O'Halloran, who was Dante in Clerks and oh, Clerks wow. 2. Yeah. And the forthcoming and unnecessary and mostly unwanted Clerks 3. I wasn't even supposed to be driving this today. Leguizamo looks back as he leaves his daughter in kind of some cheap slow motion. And then we head over to Hot Dog Chef's Nursery uh-huh. with Marky Mark, Zoe Deschanel, and Jess. Mm-hmm. And the whole time he's like, uh, so you guys uh, like hot dogs, right? And I guess <laughs> this is what passes for comedy in this movie. Yo, bro, you've been talking to my friend Jake. What has he told you? Look, we don't call it hot dogs. I just call it a big red pole. And the the hot dog chef is the first guy to be like, well, you know what this is? It's the plants. Uh-huh. And Marky Mark is like, yo, bro, enough with this hot dog bullshit. Look, I like a Coney at the Sox game like the next guy, but this ain't the time, bro. And then the, the hot dog chef just wanders through his nursery talking to the plants and like, hey, well, we got to go. See you later. And he tells them that science has proven that talking to the plants soothes them and helps mm-hmm. them grow. And his wife, who, by the way, is an actress who, who has the same birthday as I do. Oh, happy it, birthday. Yeah, thanks. Uh, to her as well, I guess. And not this month or when you hear this. Let it be a mystery. That's the twist. <laughs> so his wife comes in and he's like, hey, uh, did you get mustard? <laughs> She's like, yeah, I got mustard. We can go. And this is all just spinning our wheels for no good reason. Speaking of spinning our wheels, though, Chad, we cut to the John Leguizamo Jeep. Mm-hmm. And they have made it to Princeton. Yes. Uh, in about... I don't know, two and a half minutes, apparently. I just want to let you know that I did the mapping from Filbert to Princeton, which, according to Google Maps, would take over five hours to drive there. Yo, bro, that that's not science, though. Science tells us that pretty much anything can happen. It's kind of like magic, bro. <laughs> he used science to get to Princeton. <laughs> These are magic facts, all right? Look, you need to subscribe and, and like my YouTube channel, bro. It tells you all about how to get mysteriously from one point to the next. It doesn't even matter how long it takes. You know what? If you pay for the subscription, I'll show you how to catch a leprechaun. I was trying to monetize it, but they said that's... I'm just talking about the teleporter from Star Trek, bro. Yeah, but so they've made it there, and a bunch of lawn workers, apparently, have hung themselves. Uh-huh. Lawn workers, the front line of the happening war. <laughs> And all the passengers are like, holy shit, we got to stuff up all the vents and stuff in this car. What time of day is it, Bo? Remember earlier when we were really concerned with time check, time check? Now they've gone five hours across the state and there's dead gardeners hanging from the trees. I'm like, is it afternoon? Is it evening? Does this matter? It's science time, bro. (laughs) So there's a lady in this car or this Jeep freaking out. (laughs) Well, naturally. like you see a the lawns not me i'm not raking those leaves as she's freaking out john leguizamo is trying to distract her by doing this math magician thing where he's like oh listen say you only got a penny right what if it doubled every day for a month how much would you have i don't know like a dollar no that's stupid Two five dollars. Oh no, not even close. Twenty dollars. That's in the ballpark. I honestly forgot. Thirty? Forty? Fifty? 
100? That, you would need to eat over 1,000 bowls of your fiber breakfast cereal to equal one bowl of colon blow. <laughs> That's a lot of cereal. <laughs> <laughs> and then John Leguizamo looks up and he sees that there's this <laughs> there's this tear in the roof of the Jeep and he's like, oh no, now we're all gonna die. Does he know that the wind is what's killing everybody or is he just... I think he's been doing math on his phone and stuff through the movie, so <laughs> I think... <laughs> I think he mathed it up so that he recognizes that the plants and wind are killing people. Yeah. And so the driver... Dante. Dante stops the Jeep and is mm-hmm. like, all right, well, we're all we're all going to die now. And then, like, floors the Jeep right into a tree. Uh-huh. Dante flies out the fucking window, which is pretty good. Is that physically possible, do you think? Um, there's only one way to know, Chad, and that's science. Yo, bro, that's science, but you know what? We're going to have to turn this shit up. We're going to deal with physics, all right? You drive a red Jeep Wrangler at probably about, you know, between 20 and 278 miles an hour into an oak tree like that. You're not wearing your seatbelt. You're definitely going over that steering wheel through the windshield. You're landing up on that lawn that clearly hasn't been cut because all of the lawns keepers are hanging from the trees, bro. Look, I got to get the chalk out on this one, bro. But I think if you're going over 70, 80 miles an hour, you're just going to fly through the air like Superman until you land in China. <laughs> then John Luizamo <laughs> just gets out of this car and just luckily untouched by the accident at hand. What about the people in the backseat? Are they dead or are they just sitting there like, holy shit, Dante just went through the windshield. Where's Billy Crystal going? They're waiting for a cop to show up so they can swipe his gun. <laughs> Yeah, he gets out of the car, just, you know, sits cross-legged in the street, and then cuts Uh, his wrist. Crisscross applesauce. (laughs) Sure. And then just grabs some broken glass and cuts his wrist. It's really kind of an anticlimactic ending for this character. Yeah, it's like, just get out of the movie. Right, he's like, oh no, I got another better movie to do. You know what, they could have separated from John Leguizamo back at the train station and ended all that bullshit. Just stick them with the girl at that point. Right, and just you never know what happened to him. You assume he's Right, who dead. cares? Right. If you want to do, you know, trademarked pick six movies fan fiction <laughs> to make this better, then yes, he just disappears from the movie, and then later you get the reveal of like, oh, we heard Princeton was fucked up. Right. But we cut back to Marky Mark et al., who mm-hmm. are making their way to Holcomb, and as they're driving with the hot dog chef and his wife, they see that there are some bodies on the road up ahead. And so they're like, yo, bro, we can't go that way. Clearly, that's where the plants and breezes are. We, we can't have any part of that. Hot Dog Frank's wife, who has the same birthday as you, she goes, are those animals up in the road ahead? And are they wearing people clothes? Wait, and are they people? Those animals think they're people. I've got a dog like that. Did I tell you about Lucky? He thinks he's people. Marky Mark does, yo, bro, we got to turn around and take a different route that's got a lot less dead corpses on it. All right, turn this thing around. So they turn their car around and they head back and they run into this military Humvee and this young private hops out. I think his name's Private Dead Meat. He runs <laughs> over and he says, I'm from Westover Military Base, about 10 miles back that away. And the subtitles say that he's from this uh, military base in Dover with a D. There's a Dover military base in Delaware. And there's a Westover uh, in Massachusetts, both of which are east of Philadelphia, and they're not anywhere near Filbert. So again, the geography of this movie is all over the place. Right. You have officially done more work than M. Night Shyamalan to shore up the logic of this movie. Absolutely. We've spent more time shoring up the plot of this movie than apparently he did. Which, why would you set a movie in real cities and just botch the geography like that? Why not use authentic locations in the state of Pennsylvania? Look, bro, it's science. I mean, it re- it really, it is just like, hey, you know, we're going to try to ground this in some kind of reality, but also we're not going to pay attention to the, to the details that would actually make it convincing. Yeah, you know what? You got your compass. I got mine. North, south, grist, meast. All right. That's how it works. It's like that old comedy routine. <laughs> Whom's on first? So the, this uh, military guy, Private Dead Meat, is, is like, hey, I was at this base. It was real fucked up. Everybody was in the barbed wire and whatnot. 
And the hot dog chef is like, oh, yeah, there's bodies that way, too. It was real fucked up. Hey, 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 let me ask a question. This is kind of out of left field, probably. How do you feel about hot dogs? And, and question B, how do you feel about cheese-stuffed hot dogs? Now, uh, I know we're getting in, into the, the weeds a bit with, with hot dogs and hot dog varieties, but I got to tell you, there is something to be said for that processed cheese baked right into all them nitrates. It just, it sets off the flavor like Merlot in a good steak. At this point, some other cars show up from the other four corners of this intersection. And uh, uh, Hot Dog Frank's wife, she runs off to go talk to one of the cars and Private Dead Meat goes to talk to this other car. And we cut back to uh, Hot Dog Frank and he's in his car and Zoe Deschanel, she pulls out her phone and sees that she missed a call. And Marky Mark looks over and he sees the name on her phone and he's like, yo, bro, who's Joey? And Zoe Deschanel says, oh, he's um, he's just the little young kangaroo friend of mine from work. Sometimes we box. Mark Wahlberg says, you know, bro, maybe Hot Dog Frank is onto something about all these plants being behind this whole happening, you know, because it started in the parks and there are a lot of plants in the parks and trees and bushes and shrubs. He might be figuring this movie out. We should have lucked into getting a ride with this guy. Plus, he's got all these hot dogs. It's like an afternoon at Fenway, bro. You know, has he got any beers in that cooler? I'll tell you what, if it's nothing but domestics, I'm a perfectly happy guy. I don't like a Guinness. I'm going to tell you right now, that stuff's a little heavy for me. I like to be light on my feet. You never know when you're going to run into a Jake. Private Dead Meat and Hot Dog Frank's wife, they come back over. And then uh, it's concluded that there are dead bodies all over every road, no matter which way that you go. So they all decide to just stay put. So now it's a little later in the day because more cars have shown up. And it would be nice to know exactly what time it is now. Thanks for nothing. Missing expositional insert text over the movie. And uh, (laughs) Hot Dog Frank comes over and says, hey, there's a lady over there who's uh, talking to her daughter in Princeton. Isn't that where John Leguizamo went earlier to die in this movie? So Marky Mark and Zoe Deschanel and Jess, the daughter, they run over to where this middle-aged woman is really acting in this movie on her cell phone with like 30 people gathered around listening. And she says, she's like, honey, honey, it's okay. You're going to be okay. She's so scared. My darling daughter, light of my life, stay in your room at Princeton. Just keep looking out the window. The one with the tree outside. Someone will come and save you soon, honey. And we'll definitely be reunited for your birthday. And Marky Mark runs up to this total stranger. And he's like, nah, bro, you got to tell her to get away from that window with that tree outside. It's going to totally kill her. And so this middle-aged woman says into her phone, daughter, daughter of mine, a strange man just came over and told me that you should not go near the tree. And he wants to know if Princeton has any problems. Uh Uh-huh. Yes. You don't say. Are you sure the man that went through the windshield was the guy who played Dante and Clerks? What's that? You think Billy Crystal committed suicide in the street near the Jeep? Everyone, everyone, Billy Crystal is dead! And then the mom really dials it up and she says, Darling daughter, Stacy, you're talking strange, as though you've entered into the first symptom of some bizarre airborne disease. Shall I put you on speakerphone now for all of the world to hear? And then we hear Stacy ramble on about calculus. I see calculus and then there are footsteps and then there's this comical crashing of a window pane and then stacy is now presumed dead and her mom reacts as you expect she's like oh my god my dead daughter stacy is dead how shall i ever go on living knowing that she doesn't draw breath on earth and then mark Wahlberg, i swear to god takes her phone holds it up and he goes i hear wind from outside bro could just be between his ears hey oh i'm thinking maybe she she left off a very tall building and you're just hearing her fall for an extended period of time before she bounces to her death. Like he gets the phone in time to hear the kukunk. Oh yeah, bro. She's definitely dead now. Well, for a second there, I thought maybe she just gone out the window fast enough to fly away to safety. <laughs> you know, bro, if you're in an elevator and the cable breaks just before it hits the ground, you should jump in the air and it'll totally save your life. That's science. You can hear more about that on my YouTube channel. Science with Mocky Mock. 
be sure you hit that like and subscribe, bro. He somehow uses wizard magic science facts and just immediately teleports 200 feet away from where he was just standing. And he's on the side of the road of this rural county. And just the little girl, she walks over to Marky Mark and she whispers in his ear. And then Marky Mark, he nods his head up and down. And I think they start crying. And what did this little girl say to him? This is a fine question. My theory, Chad. I farted. (laughs) No, is, is my dad dead? And he was just like, totally, bro. He's got to be dead. I just had a girl uh, having a real encounter with a poltergeist tree right outside a window. It was real fucked up, bro. Also, I think Zoe Deschanel is dead. Oh, wait, there she is. Sometimes if I don't see somebody long enough, I just assume they're dead. Like he has no object permanence like an infant in this movie. She just leans in and goes, it's who, not whom. You sound like a jackass. You sound like a damn moron when you say it like that. (laughs) Hey, look, it's just like the old saying, make like a tree in whom. And so the (laughs) hot dog chef further elucidates on plants talking to each other as uh, the group is gathered. And he's like, oh, no, you know, hey, you know, plants, they can basically chit chat and target specific uh, plants to talk to and talk like trees can talk to bushes. Bushes can talk to grass. Grass can talk to ferns. Drive cars. They share an energy. It, It surrounds us. It binds us between you, me, the tree, the rock, everywhere. Yes. It's some sort of a hot dog type connection. Look, bro, I don't need your hot dog connections. I got my blaster right here. And now we will be doing the rest of the film Star Wars with Hot Dog Chef as Obi-Wan Kenobi. (laughs) Marky Mark and Private Deadmeat, they're looking at this map that they got from a local Shoney's to tell them which way to go. (laughs) It is. There might as well be like a maze and a word find on it. Dotted line that leads to a treasure trunk that's open with shiny gold doubloons inside. (laughs) Yeah, he's like, 21, 22, (laughs) 23. Look at that, bro. It's a honeybee. I I didn't know what it was till I got to the last number, but now look, it's a bee. (laughs) By the way, bro, you got any theories on why all the honeybees are dying? Do you think they're getting put into all of these little maps that they're giving away at Shoney's? Oh my God, I think I figured it out, bro. You seem pretty good with all this plant stuff. What do you think about bees? Also, side note, how come Jerry Seinfeld was in that movie and all of a sudden it turned into a courtroom drama, bro? These two are looking at this map and Private Deadmeat says, The radio said that all this started in the cities, then it spread to the towns, and now it's on the roads. And Marky Mark says, Yo, bro, whatever's happening is happening in smaller and smaller populations. We gotta split up or it's gonna get onto us, bro. So this impromptu mass of people, they just split up into two smaller groups and they wander off into the woods to get off the rural roads. And Marky Mark and Zoe Deschanel and Jess, they're wandering off with the first group of survivors and they go on this walkabout and Zoe Deschanel says, hey, Marky Mark, I need to tell you something. Uh, that guy, Joey, who called me, he's not really a baby kangaroo from work. Um, he's a real person and we had dessert one time and now he thinks he might be able to get into my pants and he just keeps calling me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Zoe Deschanel, are you telling me you went to eat dessert with a kangaroo? No, I'm telling you that Joey is not a baby kangaroo and that we had dessert. That's a million times worse if you went to dinner with an adult kangaroo. Mature kangaroos have a penis like a fucking jackhammer. I can't compete with that, bro. Let me try to say this again real quick. So a baby kangaroo is a Joey, but the guy at my work, his name is Joey and he's not a baby kangaroo or an adult kangaroo. He's not a kangaroo at all but his name is joey and we had cake one night after work and i didn't tell you about it oh my god you had cake with this guy and you didn't even bring the kangaroo from work that's (laughs) fucked up bro so he did chanel says anyway uh marky mark look i don't want to die like this with this cake and kangaroo on my uh conscience so i just want to come clean with you look i can't even look at you right now i'm just gonna throw in my headphones listen to a little acdc i just got whom made whom on my on my new cassette tape about this time the wind starts blowing part of our second band of merry wanderers they're all arguing and then they all freeze and you know we all pretty much know what's going on uh hot dog frank and his wife they're part of this second group along with private dead meat who starts screaming out about my firearms my friend it will not leave my side so he immediately takes his gun off of his side he starts walking backwards and then he shoots himself in the head we cut back to our first group with marky mark zoe de chanel at all and we hear gunshots over 
kind of the the crest of the grass and marky mark just says on up bro that sounds like gunshots that can't be good let's make an implausible conjecture here bro it's got to be the toxin in the wind it's infecting everybody and it's at this point the greatest line in the movie is uttered yes because everyone in, in a different <laughs> movie with different dialogue, this would be kind of a tense scene where he's trying to put all the pieces together. Zoe Deschanel and all the other people in this group are like, tell us what to do. What should we do? <laughs> Marky Mark, help us. You're the science teacher here. Lead us. And he goes, oh, oh my God. Be scientific, douchebag. Dude, be scientific, douchebag. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh is maybe not just the best line of this movie, one of the best lines in any movie we've ever covered on this show. Yeah, it's up there. But I just want to go back to a point that you made in a different movie with different dialogue, different characters, and different actors. This could be a really good scene. I'm saying that the way that the camera is moving back and forth and close up on him, like there's some stuff where it's like, oh, M. Night Shyamalan knows how to build tension. But when Marky Mark says, be scientific, douchebag, it drains the tension away. And what is left is laughter. And that is not what you want from your tense moment in a movie. It's just too much stupid coming at once. Zoe Deschanel says, we really should do something, Marky Mark. We can't be like those assholes on the news who hear people shooting themselves and don't do anything. We're not assholes, Marky Mark. At this point, Marky Mark spouts off the five steps of the scientific approach, and he comes up with a solution. He's like, yo, we need to split up into even smaller groups. That's what's being targeted. Large groups of people, bro. The plants are releasing the toxin, and this is clearly the work of poison ivy or maybe swamp thing we got to get to Arkham asylum like stat that guy in the tiger cage had it right he was breaking up into the smallest group he could one part of his arm was going one way another arm was going with another lion <laughs> there's no way those plants were going to attack him that way yeah that guy's definitely the sur- lone survivor at the zoo you know then chad the most terrifying moment of the movie happens when after they hear all these gunshots and all the other group is presumed dead you know after him saying like hey it's probably small groups they see a breeze coming at them oh my god and instead of tilting their head up into the sunshine and right. enjoying the cool breeze on their skin yes. they're like we're all gonna die and <laughs> run from the wind and then the wind just kind of blows past them and they're like oh i guess we're cool <sighs> Yo, bro, nothing happened, you know? I guess that proves my science, bro. If you're in a small enough group, the wind just lets you go. (laughs) Like, we can't even legitimately make fun of this because it's so inherently stupid and silly. Us making fun of it, it feels like the movie itself is a parody, but it's clearly not. (laughs) One of the things that's also really frustrating about this movie is that it consistently introduces new characters that then immediately leave the film. You mean like Jared and Doug? I I was going to say the cat in the hat kid and the other kid, because as the groups are getting smaller and smaller, we have Marky Mark, Zoe Deschanel, just a little girl, the kid from the Cat in the Hat movie with Mike Myers, and then this other kid. So there's five of them. And then Mark Wahlberg sees a truck out in a field and he runs over to look for another map, presumably from a Burger King or maybe a McDonald's. Yo, bro, the fry guys say we should go this way. If we go the other way, I gotta tell you, that hamburger, he's definitely gonna cause some trouble for us, all right? I'll tell you what, if we don't get Mayo McCheese on the case, we could be in some real trouble here, bro. Marky Mark looks off on the horizon and he sees the top of the house that anyone looking in that direction would clearly see. So, of course, he says, yo, bro, look, there's a house over there. Come on. I'm a genius. You got to follow me. So everybody follows him and they make their way over to this house. And uh, as they're going, Zoe Deschanel asks Mark Wahlberg, so do you really think it could be the plants? And Mark Wahlberg says, look, bro, I've never been wrong in this movie. So, yes. All right. We got to get to the least populated place on Earth to be be safe. That's what we got to do. So Zoe Deschanel says, that sounds great. We've got to get to this house. And once we're inside, they got to have a bathroom because it's a house. And I'm going to take Jess inside the house and go to the bathroom because I'm about 90 minutes overdue for growing a record setting monkey tail. No worries, bro. I'm just I'm just going to sit here and go over this map. We got to get to do what did he city before night falls. Marky Mark is left in this house alone. And uh, there's this tall house plant that starts moving. It's like the air conditioning just kicked on. And we get to see Marky Mark act with a 
ficus tree in this film. <laughs> yeah, and the ficus tree just runs circles around him. It's like watching Andy McDowell and whatever Muppet shared screen time with her in Muppets in Space, where you're just like, how is this inanimate object emoting more than a human being? You know, they actually filmed an entire movie with Andy McDowell and Kim Basinger acting across from one another, but it created a vortex <laughs> that sucked the entire plot and other actors into it. In this scene, Marky Mark, he ambles up to this plant and he goes, yo, bro, look, I'm Marky Mark. Maybe you heard of me. I'm a world famous high school science teacher slash underwear model. I don't want no trouble, bro. All right, look, my girlfriend, or maybe she's my wife. I don't know what she is. She's in the back and she's taking a dump in the bathroom. And after that, we're going to be on our way. It's probably going to take about 15 minutes. She tightens up when she gets nervous. All right. Hope it's okay with you, plant, bro. And then Marky Mark reaches out and touches the plant. And he's like, oh my God, I'm talking to a plastic plant. And uh, this is supposed to be funny but it's it's not well it can't be chad because the idea of talking to a real plant this way is just as fucking stupid yeah it's not any better if the plant isn't plastic <laughs> right it's kind of like a relief i suppose this movie can't be funny because it's already such a ridiculous premise that the attempts at humor are just like no 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 that's not funny get back to marky mark like explaining the plant problem in the first place and that's as funny as anything else like your attempts at humor are underdone by the ridiculous nature of the movie itself you know it's sort of the reverse problem not problem but it's the reverse of airplane Right. Where everyone plays it straight, but everything is so ridiculous, and that's why it's funny. But here... Everything's ridiculous. Right. Everyone plays it straight, and it's supposed to not be funny, right. but it that's, is. That's the problem. Like, this movie works better as a comedy than it does as a thriller. Which is a real problem if you're a thriller. <laughs> I think it's funnier as a thriller than it would be as a comedy. Right. But a bit, again, that's not the territory you want to be in. <laughs> Maybe that's the twist. He knew that it was funny when he made it. And he was like, people are going to hate this. It's like what they did with those, you know, Sharknado movies. Or The Room, when the dude from The Room was like, oh, yes, Mark, I thought it was going to be a comedy all along. Yeah. I mean, we'll get to it when, when we conclude this movie, but it really is one of those movies that, like, you can't appropriately describe how fucking ridiculous ridiculous this movie is and this scene of him talking with the plastic plant is just like the cherry on top how can it not be intentional this scene was supposed to be funny but i don't think m night Shyamalan is a funny person no you know it's one not. of those things where it's like i recognize comedy i understand when comedy is happening but i can't replicate it Dude, I got a joke I want to tell you. So there's two guys pissing in a bathroom. Mm -hmm. Go on. And one of them looks at the other one's dick. You know what? I'll save it for later. You know what? I, I read the book by Gore Vidal. We cut to the kitchen of this house, and these two teenagers are hanging out in there, and uh, teenager number two says, hey, everything in this house is fake, and he holds up a glass of orange juice that he turns upside down and doesn't spill out. So clearly this is a model home, and this place uh, probably doesn't have running water. So Zoe Deschanel is up in the bathroom on the second floor, and she's about to have a level of panic that we have not seen since Harry Dunn had explosive diarrhea in Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> oh my god look at that thing it's up over the lip clink 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 i gotta get the hell out of here <laughs> so downstairs marky mark and fat josh are having this heart to heart uh at this fake dinner table about uh -huh. microbes and shit in australia uh-huh and he's like listen bro these things uh happen in nature all the time it's like the algae in australia that killed a bunch of people mm -hmm. all we gotta do is be alive when the bloom recedes right all the bees are disappearing too you got any theories on disappearing bees do you think this place has any honey nut cheerio stashed in the cupboards to be honest, I'd go for an algal death bloom right now. I'm really peckish. I'm not going to lie to you, bro. I could go for a cracker with some algae on it. Zoe Deschanel and Jess wander back into our movie, and Zoe Deschanel says, raw, raw, Whatever you do, stay out of the upstairs toilet. Somebody showed up way before we did and destroyed that place. Raw, raw. So, <laughs> right. It's real like, hey, uh, somebody before we got here. <laughs> 
The worst cover of the world is if you're at a party or like, you know, a dinner or something with friends and you just take one of those shits that's like, oh man, like if I were at home, I would sit and marvel at this for a second and just be impressed this came out of me. And then you flush <laughs> it and you get that like, oh, like the, clink, that clink. where it goes down, but the water flow is not enough. Like, you know that that big hunk of shit that you just produced is somewhere in a pipe altogether. It's not broken up. It's not flowing through the pipes or nothing. And hold, you, hold. So you wait for the tank to fill and you hit the button on the toilet again. The lever on the toilet, I suppose. And then you hear like the pipes try to push that shit through and like like that like as the the groan of metal and copper and then the water starts to rise chad and you're like fuck gotta go (laughs) right and then you come out of the bathroom you're like hey man somebody was just in the bathroom a second ago i walked in there i was just gonna take a piss i mean nothing i don't have to shit or nothing but i walked into the bathroom to take a leak and it turns out that the water's overflowing i don't know what asshole did that and just left it but whoever owns this house you need to grab a plunger my friend yeah, has Zoe Deschanel been here? Because it really looked like her handiwork. She has been eating nothing but raw ribeye and Metamucil for about the past week and a half. Yeah, she she snacks on mulch and, and number two pencils. It's weird. She ate 14 cans of Duncan Hines frosting. Now, I don't know what that does to a person, but I know what it does to their shits. The Learning Channel is going to have a, a show for her after one of those Bigfoot hunter shows. Do- Zoe, Zoe de Chanel's Snackateria Shitstorm. You ever hear River Monsters? This one's called Toilet Monsters and it is hosted by Zoe de Chanel, who is also the subject of every episode. You see her eat the equivalent of 15 regular meals worth of grain. Now, pure grain, not refined, just grain. Then she is going to go into this bathroom, and if that toilet can withstand the shit of one Zoe de Chanel, then you and your entire family will win $100,000. And they will also donate $15,000 to a charity of your choice, as long as it is not the Zoe de Chanel toilet fund. Also, uh, you, you are going to need that money to replace your septic tank. <laughs> Just an FYI. Little heads up on that one. Look, as producer of this show, Zoe de Chanel's shit show, I can tell you that it almost a hundred percent, and when I say almost a hundred percent, exactly one hundred percent of every contestant on this show has had to replace the toilet, interior plumbing, and septic tank. <laughs> That is a guarantee of the Travel Channel. For good measure, you should probably also replace your air conditioning unit and repaint the house. Every room. Now, you're not going to have to worry about priming the bathroom. That paint is going to be gone. That is going to be peeled right off the wall. Also, if you have pets in your home, you are going to want to get them out during the actual (laughs) shitting. You can bring them back in after it's over, but while she is shitting, the toxicity of the air in the house will be such... Imagine you are getting your house fumigated for termites. That is equivalent to the level of protection you need to indulge in. So after Zoe Deschanel and uh, Jess shit up the second floor of this house, everybody decides to leave. And as they're scampering off, they're up on this hilltop and they look down below in the valley and there are all these model homes there. And we see a gathering of people. It's maybe like 15 frightened individuals. And then whew, they all stop moving. And then one of them goes over and turns on an industrial sized lawnmower. And then ACDC kicks in and who made whom? <laughs> who made you? <laughs> If you made them and they made you. And the lawnmower just romps over and just runs over this guy and mulches him up. Not to continue with our Pig Six fan fiction. Uh This is what this movie should have been, though. It should have been maximum overdrive with plants. You know, yeah, I'd like, be down with that. Right. Just embrace how dumb the concept is and get behind the kills, have a bunch of crazy characters, that kind of thing, instead of what we have, which takes itself way too seriously. Marky Mark and these two teenagers, they're walking side by side. And teenager number two says, is that little girl your kid? And Marky Mark says, nah, bruh. And then the teenager says, you got kids? And Marky Mark says, nah, bruh. And then teenager 
number. She says, why not? You got a problem? And Bo, my question for you is, what problem is this kid referring to? Oh, he is obviously implying that Marky Mark's dick don't work so good. Okay, because I was worried he was implying that he was gay and that maybe this teenager knew Jake and they'd been talking and it was going to get really uncomfortable for Marky Mark. I'm pretty sure that Jake's going to have my butt baby, bro. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think that's how it works. So teenager number one, who you last saw in the Cat in the Hat movie, he looks over and notices that Marky Mark has a mood ring. And then our quintet uh, comes across a radio that is just hanging off the side of a wooden fence. And they turn it on and the announcer says, all of those in the affected area of the Northeast are asked to proceed due west. And I'm like, why is this movie stopping to tell us this? Do we need to know any of these facts? And did they take the radio with them? Seems like it might have some more useful information later. There are all of these little pit stops that happen in this movie that don't mean anything. A lot of this feels like time filler, which is fine because this movie comes in at a, a smooth 90 minutes. Zoe Deschanel says, hey, we need to stop for a 10 minute break and get just the little girl some food and maybe listen to some 40s era jazz. Marky Mark then sees a house in the distance surrounded by trees. And after he spies this tree, he's like, listen, bro, look, I got to tell you something before we go to this house surrounded by killer trees. I was at a pharmacy recently. I saw this pharmacist. She was pretty cute. I almost bought a six dollar bottle of cough syrup just so I could talk to her a little bit. I think her name was Jake. She was in my fourth period science class, sitting at the front desk, working in the pharmacy. Replace the wood pharmacy with my classroom. And pretty girl behind the counter with this guy, Jake, who's got a good looking nose and ears. I don't care what happens with a fraction of an inch here or there. That guy's a looker. And then she's like, oh my God, are you joking, Marky Mark? And he's like, oh, I'm totally joking. Look, finally, she's just like, thank you. And I'm like, what the, what are you thanking him for? Why are human beings talking to each other like this in this movie? Well, don't worry. You're going to get a whole lot more of that in the finale. This is true. But then, Chad, comes... Look, my favorite scene in the movie is, of course, when a bunch of construction workers just swan dive off of the construction site. This tops that. This scene in which we come to this house in a clearing... And we get a bit of a a scene of high suspense, Chad. M. Night Shyamalan trademark suspense as this, (laughs) this kid Jess is swinging in a tire swing on this tree. Yeah. But then Jared and Doug, <laughs> our kids, the cat in the hat kid, etc., are trying to bust into this house. They're like, hey, it doesn't look like anybody's here. Let's get in. The guy inside the house says, get out of here. You ain't going to bring that poison gas in this house with you. And then Zoe Deschanel says, hey, it's okay. I took a shit at the model home over the ridge. My tank is completely empty. <laughs> but the guy inside is like, I ain't talking about your famously vile farts, <laughs> Zoe Deschanel. I ain't letting nobody in this house. And to sway them i guess marky mark christ just start singing hey bro oh black water keep on turning mississippi moon hey is this working bro this is the least normal thing you can do to try to convince somebody to let you into their house he could have pulled out a ventriloquist dummy and started (laughs) doing like just hacky jokes and it would have made as much sense singing black water what the fuck are you doing imagine someone knocks on the door of your house you're like hello hey bro it's me marky mark i want to come inside zoe de chanel's got to take a shit no i don't like seriously we got to come in we need food for a little girl uh no i'm good marky mark i don't need you to come inside oh black water keep on rolling let me in your house Zoe Deschanel's got a shit <laughs> but look, like, what imagine it is today in in today's America Chad for listeners this is recorded at the height of not height of we'll see uh, during the coronavirus crisis imagine we are in a statewide quarantine as we are now right somebody comes to the door and is like hey bro you gotta let me in and you're like look man it's a quarantine i don't i don't know that i should be just letting you in willy-nilly oh black water keep on (laughs) turning like you would call the fucking police (laughs) or you would do what the owner of this house does because the kid from the cat in the hat movie he just walks over to the door and just demands open the door we want some food for a little girl you pussy and then the cat in the hat kid he starts kicking on the door with his foot boom boom until a shotgun comes out and just blasts this child in the chest filling him with buckshot and he is dead oh it's so good 
I will shoot you with a gun. I will shoot you in the sun. I will shoot you in the park. I'll shoot you next to Marky Mark. Kick my door and down you fell right next to Zoe Deschanel. Shooting a child's not all I do. I'll reload my gun and shoot your friend too. Which is what happens. Jared, his pal, takes one to the skull too. Yeah, they shoot a kid in the, in the head. Oh, it's so good, man. And then with the kid's dead, the people inside are just like, well, guess we're good. And they just stop shooting. Like, there is no reason for them not to continue on to kill Marky Mark. But they do. They're just like, well, I guess we got our quota for the day. Yeah, we and- killed two random citizens. That's all we can do legally in this state, at least this month. We're down to Marky Mark, Zoe Deschanel, and Jess, who's like eight years old. And this little girl doesn't say a whole lot in this movie. And she's clearly going to grow up emotionally scarred and strung out on drugs as a base case scenario, as a somewhat functioning member of society zoe deschanel runs over to marky bark and she's like we gotta go we gotta protect jess i promised billy crystal i would take care of her daughter earlier and jess rightly the the one person in this movie who seems to understand the situation has fucking run yeah well children are getting shot she's next if they're going in descending age order she is next on the chopping block and zoe deschanel and marky mark chase after her and they catch up to her so they can all just sit there and cry together and and then we go to Petersburg, West Virginia, where we see some old women watching a news report while they sit there in gas masks mm-hmm. and then go to Jacksonville, Florida, where some Latino folks are watching it, too. And then the scientists are they watching this on the news or Marky Mark's YouTube channel? Is this happening outside of the northeastern part of the United States? The- Again, this movie was made, you know, seven years after uh, September 11th, 2001. So one presumes this is supposed to reflect panic growing in other parts of the country. But it's just so poorly done and then this scientist on the news is like you know what this is probably gonna be over real quick why i don't know he was like it's definitely gonna be over tomorrow morning at 9 a.m or maybe by easter definitely by april when the sun comes out in the springtime all of this virus will go away if you (laughs) want a test you can get a test yeah warm weather is gonna kill our, our trees rain has anyone thought about rain What about music? Have we tried playing music at the trees? Kiss, I hear, will make them eventually surrender. All black water, keep on moving, Mississippi moon watch. Somebody had Marky Mark a microphone and have them see black water at the trees (laughs) until they surrender. (laughs) Or let them in, whatever. And then we see some rednecks loading guns somewhere. Sure. Right. And then zoom into a TV map where we see trees swaying ominously. Because again, the big threat of this movie are our friends the trees. And pleasant breezes. Yes. And so Marky Mark and his crew have found a new house with no electricity to loot. And the driveway looks deserted. And he's like going inside to check it out. He's like, yo, bro, I I sure hope there's not a bunch of kid killing rednecks inside. And then he rings this bell, uh, like a a dinner bell uh, sort of on the porch. Then this old woman just goes, that's for Clement, my dog. And he's like, holy shit, bro. I didn't even see you there. What are you doing? She's like, I'm just sitting here being crazy. I'm drinking a glass of lemon drink. And you're like, wait, what what did you call it? It's lemon drink. Are you saying lemonade, bro? It's lemon drink. I hate to keep bothering you about this and all. Lemon drink. I thought I'd invite you inside and maybe give you some cheese food spread. Got a container of I can't believe it's not butter. Now, who have you ever heard call it lemon drink before, bro? That's crazy. Sure enough. She's like, guess I gotta make you supper. And then we cut to the most awkward dinner scene since the last Thanksgiving I attended, where they're all just eating in relative silence. And then, just to throw some more exposition out there, this old lady goes, There's a speaking tube between the house and an old shed out back. They used to hide slaves out there. Could could hear you just as clear as if you were in the same room. Yo, bro, that's crazy. You're saying that like it's going to mean something later. Then this kid, Jess, starts reaching for this cookie on a plate. Uh And this old woman just goes, no, and just smacks her hand. Yeah, it's pretty violent, too. You don't touch things that aren't yours, little girl. And then gives her one anyway. It's just like, I'm just proving a point. There's like 20 minutes left in this movie. And our villain in the whole film thus far, as you noted, has been the wind and plants and trees. And now our movie introduces 
introduces this wild card crazy old lady. This is the woodland version of Zed's basement. Why are we being introduced to this sadistic mean old lady? Like, why do we have to pay attention to yet another kook in this film? Marky Mark says to her, yo, bro, you got no phone here? No lights? No motor car? You, you don't have a single luxury. It's like Robin Can- San Caruso, bro. This place is as primitive as can be. What do you do if there's like a big major world event, like where the plants start killing everybody? By the way, do you have bees around here? Yeah, and she's just like, first of all, I don't have bees ever. Ever since I saw that Seinfeld movie. Second of all, I don't want to know what happened out there. World don't care about me. I don't care about it. And this is the first time in the movie where I was like, I I can relate to that. I'm (laughs) starting to, uh, now I'm on board. Now I think this old lady's all right. Now, because we took forever to have dinner, we're down to 10 minutes left in this movie. So let's wrap this thing up. It's nighttime and Jess is asleep in the bed. And Zoe Deschanel says, you know, I'm uh, I'm sorry about that whole Joey thing. Not a kangaroo. And I want to let you know that uh, the cake I had wasn't that great. I think, you know, we could maybe mend things between us. And then there's this creak outside the bedroom door frame. It's not the door because there is no door to close on this bed room so marky mark walks over and peeks outside and the creepy old lady is standing there in her nightgown and she says i hear you whispering in there are you planning on stealing something and marky mark says yo bro we're not stealing your old falling apart junk in this house we're just whispering because it's night and we didn't want to wake you up have your creepy ass sneaking around trying to peek in on us in this bedroom frankly we're really uncomfortable spending time with you you slapped a little girl earlier no offense but you know it's kind of nuts you like hot dogs and then she says well are you planning on murdering me then yo what we're not we're not gonna murder you are you gonna murder us if so then we're taking our chances with the toxic bushes outside his reaction of what no <laughs> is genuinely a laugh in the movie i don't know if it's meant to be funny but (laughs) it it had me in stitches when what no no that's not even science bro i mean i know you don't have electricity out here but maybe you got a cell phone or something you can still subscribe to my youtube channel marky mark is somehow able to fall asleep at night and we see him awake in the morning and zoe deschanel and jess they're gone so marky mark he gets dressed in his clean clothes and comes downstairs and he can't find anybody so marky mark knocks on this closed door downstairs he opens it up and goes into this old lady's spare bedroom and there's this made bed with a creepy doll laying on it and marky mark initially thinks that this is the mean old lady but it's clearly half the size of her body he, there's no way he's thinking it's her be like if i walked in and saw a cabbage patch doll on the bed and i'm like deborah is that you <laughs> oh wait maybe some science happened in the middle of the night and turned it into a doll bro it's ridiculous. <laughs> like, he's lifting the doll up to check underneath it. Seeing if she has a pulse. Yeah. Putting a mirror under the doll's nose to see if it's still breathing. <laughs> yeah, but he's like, Mrs. Jones, is that you? And then she's just like... It's clearly not her. <laughs> right, of course not. And then the old woman is just like, you all need to get the hell out of my house. You're stupid. <laughs> then she just goes outside to recite the Lord's Prayer, I guess. It's the 23rd Psalm, Bo. Uh, Read a Bible. Uh, Never. (laughs) And then he's like in the doorway. He's like, hey, can we just talk calmly for a second? I'm a teacher over here. I'm a science teacher. You know? Hey, by the way, why are you starting to walk backwards? You practice in the moonwalk? Oh, black water, keep on turning. (laughs) Did you see Michael Jackson at that 25th anniversary of Motown? That shit was amazing. When she starts walking backwards, he just runs back into the house. Oh shit, bro. I know how this story ends. Oh boy. Shit's really starting to pop off now. Things are getting exciting (laughs) the last seven minutes of this movie. And then he yells for Zoe Deschanel, who is in this, you know, the carriage house or whatever uh, attached to the land. Yeah, the slave shack or whatever it is. Right. Through the tube, he's like, yo, bro, shut all the doors and windows. I think the trees have gotten the dander up again. (laughs) It's just one old lady and the trees went after. I mean, she's kind of a bitch, let's be honest, but still, that's not the kind of behavior you want out of your trees and breezes. And then this old woman just comes up to the house and starts pounding her head on the wall outside. Right, as old women are wont to do. We've all had grandmas. And (laughs) she busts her head through a fucking window and Uh winds up with a big glassy face with chugs of glass sticking out of it. And the wind starts pouring in like it's invisible water. (laughs) 
great. Like it's the Titanic and it's capsizing and Marky Mark runs up the stairs like, holy shit, bro, this wind's after me. Then Marky Mark keeps hearing laughter and he's like, holy shit, was all the, it's the wind laughing at me now? <laughs> Whom do you think you are, wind? You can't have any right to laugh at me. I mean, it's fucked up enough. You're making everybody kill themselves, but mocking them too. That's just being a real dick, wind. <laughs> Then he puts two and two together. He's like, oh, right. There's this whole tube. She told us about that last night at dinner. He tells her again, like, make sure you close all the windows and the, and the doors. The plants have gotten a lot more sensitive. But he's like, you know, this old lady was alone. And Zoe Deschanel, out of nowhere, is just like, oh, my God. I, I just wish I was there with you, you know. <laughs> then we get the history of this stupid mood ring. Which, it turns out, he bought for her on their first date, and it turned purple because she was horny. Which is, you know, romantic, I guess? And she was like, oh, I I remember that yours was blue, because you're peaceful. And then Marky Mark is just like, you know what, bro? Fuck this noise. I'm gonna come get some. (laughs) And then just walks outside into the lawn as the wind is blowing. And Zoe Deschanel is like, you know what? I'm with you. Let's just die, or... And let's take this child with us. (laughs) She flings open the door, ignoring the safety of this child. And then they rush to each other in this windy field, Chad. But, Bo, they don't die. Yeah, it's 9.58 a.m. By the skin of their teeth, they're okay. And then they just go back into this house and hang out. And Marky Mark is just like, look, bro, you know I know a lot about science. I think this just may have ended for no good reason. Fade to black. Three months later. Yeah, and what city are we in? Philly? New York? Baltimore? Who knows? All we get is the text that says it's three months later. Right, we don't care where we are, what time it is anymore. No. We're done with all that. Zoe Deschanel is there with Jess, and Jess is on her first day back to school. And uh, these two say, I love you to one another and off she goes then we see marky mark and he puts jess on a school bus apparently high school isn't back open on this day because marky mark doesn't look dressed for a day at work and then the movie explains itself with this bargain basement larry king live knockoff where this scientist explains why the event started at 8 33 on a tuesday and ended at 9 27 the next wednesday it doesn't matter beyond anything i just said it is reinforcing the idea of this movie movie which is look it's a scientific principle bro we're never going to understand it i mean at the end of the day whom knows <laughs> this scientist on this larry king live show he goes well i was speaking to my son jake and he and i concluded that this is an act of nature that we will never fully understand and you're just like just please don't do this movie the scientist is like we think this is a warning from the plants really a shot across the bow of humanity and then we cut to the upstairs bathroom where zoe deschanel just took a shit like the reason they had to move in the first place was because of one of her boomers dude they have like five plungers in this bathroom of varying sizes and shapes plungers a toilet snake a stick of dynamite whatever you gotta do to break this up (laughs) she's got a bullhorn where she just yells at it sometimes oh look how about you get out of there shit so she has a positive pregnancy test to prove that marky mark's dick works i guess Uh uh-huh and then she just starts grinning like the fucking joker well because she's excited because now she has a reason to tell marky mark that they can get divorced because joey from work got her pregnant no joey jojo shabadoo was really (laughs) packing so she runs outside to meet marky mark who was seeing the kid off and and we don't hear her tell him, but, you know, she apparently tells him she's pregnant and they embrace. Fade to black again. Fucking Return of the King. This movie just doesn't know when to end. And meanwhile, in Paris, Chad. Is this Paris, France or Paris, Tennessee? This is Paris, Tennessee. You can tell by the champs of Lises. <laughs> There's some French dudes just strolling down the the Champs-Élysées talking about some party. And then you hear someone scream in the distance, eerily reminiscent of the beginning of the film, Chad. Uh Uh-huh. And then everyone just stops. Yeah. And then we fade to black. We go again, Bo. And then how fucking dare you on against a black backdrop, a film by M. Night Shyamalan. Les Happening Du. That would be the only way to do a sequel to this if you called it Les Happening. La Happening. <laughs> and that's it. That's the happening. And it's... Not good. No, it's not good. It is 
It is bad. Some people die in this movie. It doesn't feel as pandemic as Outbreak. It feels, you know, more focused. I felt like that there would be more easy breezy tree deaths that are happening, but it seems like you really just only see, you know, like 12 people that die in this film from this freaky weird thing that goes down. Yeah, I mean, the biggest flaw of this movie is, as I mentioned in the intro, Shyamalan talked about how he wanted this to be a B movie that was kind of good and the problem is that it never does what b movies do which is kind of embrace the schlockiness right and like the scene where the guy lays down in front of the lawnmower and where the guys in the house murder these kids that we met two minutes ago like that stuff is like okay well that's a good b movie like stuff is happening things are it's a little nonsensical and it's a little gratuitous but that's kind of what b movies are for like being a little overly violent and a little bawdy and a little ribald and you know that kind of thing that's what a good b movie is it does something you you make up for the lack of budget by doing something an a movie would not do yeah i can see how they were trying for that it just it doesn't land i think it's also one of those things because he was the writer director producer voiceover performer in this that you're expecting a certain level of quality and to come in and try to do something that's being a little more campy or over the top just doesn't meet those expectations and also the campiness is kind of undone by the fact that the movie is being so on its soapbox about environmental issues Uh but it's not clever about it there's a movie that we will probably reference later in this season uh called day of the animals which is like an old 70s movie that's about how if the ozone layer is depleted enough all the animals will attack people and that's kind of what this movie ought to have been yeah the difference is that day of the animals features a bare-chested leslie nielsen fighting a bear with a stick over the love of a woman which is brilliant right (laughs) and this movie has none of that this movie needs a couple of dashes of planet terror and i think it would probably taste just right yeah it it needs to be more over the top and and more ridiculous than it is or it needs to be more serious or let's be honest shad not have the villain be trees and gentle breezes yeah that would help you know a movie that's really over the top Mm -hmm. that has villains that aren't breezes or treeses or monkeys that sneezes Mm -hmm. how about a movie about aliens that pop up from the ground i love alien movies this season so far we've been attacked by viruses we've been attacked by plants and wind it's about time that we get attacked from outer space by way of inner space and coming up on episode three of season 11 of pick six movies we are going to feature the war of the world starring one of the biggest actors of the last ever tom cruise oh boy with one of the greatest directors of all time, Mr. Steven Spielberg. How dare we, Bo? How dare we take on a movie like this? Uh, How dare we, Chad? One word, 1941. (laughs) This feels like, once again, we we are going after a sacred cow, and it's definitely one of the movies that we will be able to go to our Facebook page and see people talking about what a great movie it is Yeah, without ever knowing that we are going to really take this one through the mud. It's going to be a lot of fun. So come back and see us in two weeks' time. As always, like, rate, review. You can send us an email at pick6movies at gmail.com. That's S-I-X, not the number six. We're not heathens here. We spell things out with letters. You know, the numbers of words. Literary. That's what they call it, Chad. Bo, any final thoughts on the happening as we say goodbye and bid adieu to this motion picture as it disappears like dust in the wind? You know, the, the sad thing is, Chad, there is about a an eighty percent chance I will watch this movie again. There's a zero percent chance I will ever watch it again. Man, be scientific, douchebag. I mean, I can't resist it, man. It's a siren call to me. You and I are very different people. <laughs> Come back and see us in two weeks, and we will have another disastrous motion picture in this season's theme. We're all gonna die! See you in two weeks, folks. Maybe. Bum, bum, bum.